call the meeting to order and just allow the public gallery to fill. Members for the temperature is a bit warm or it's okay. nice. Just nice. Just nice. Just pleasant. Okay, can I advise those in the public gallery as they take their seats that they are very welcome and they can use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and that all devices are muted. They can also connect to the assembly Wi-Fi, password details of which are available on the gallery rules, and it is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Okay, members, agenda item one is apologies. We've received apologies from Justin McNulty. Are there any other apologies? Here. No? Okay, thank you. Agenda item two then, chairperson's business. <coughs> Can I indicate to members that you may have noticed recent press reports <coughs> in respect of precautionary measures in schools designed to limit uh, any spread of coronavirus? The Public Health Agency is providing updated guidance and I would suggest to the committee that we would write to the Department of Education seeking uh, urgent assurance uh, that schools are clear on how to provide a proportionate response whilst keeping parents, pupils and indeed our committee informed. Are members agreed? Yes. Agreed. agreed. Okay then, uh, agenda item 2.2 is our supply resolution debate. Members will be aware that in the supply resolution debate on Monday the 24th of February, I spoke on behalf of the committee commenting on departmental financial performance in 2019-20 to and indicating the committee's support for the department's resource and capital builds, um, whilst emphasising the need for reform in addition to investment. The Finance Minister advised that the executive budget will be agreed at the end of March, following information on the spending envelope, which it is understood will be available on the 11th of March. Clark, will we receive detailed briefings at that time? I think the committee will probably seek that. There'll be a further uh, budget bill and as part of that sequence, so uh, I will uh, advise the uh, department accordingly. That's great, thank you. Okay, members then, uh, draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of our meeting on the 19th of February? at page six and seek members' agreements that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Agenda item four, matters arising. There are no matters arising unless anyone wishes to raise an issue. No? Yeah. Uh, just around, yes, uh, you, you had mentioned the coronavirus there. Yep. Uh, and this is something that's bored me for a number of weeks. I know the health minister has confirmed to the house that he and his department are ready in the event of an outbreak, and I, I trust his advice to the house. And I know that every preparation, particularly in terms of policy, in the event of an outbreak, <coughs> is considered. But there doesn't seem to be across the various departments any obvious preparations been made in terms of providing simple guidelines or a fact sheet of what symptoms to look out for for the ordinary. If we're talking about education, teacher, classroom assistant, uh, and how, how they would identify uh, potential threats uh, of uh, coronavirus within uh, the school. So, e even simple things, again, I was doing a lot of reading into this hand sanitizers, strong soap, guidance around <coughs> hand hygiene, cleaning surfaces, uh, and ensuring that people are on alert for this. Because we're looking at a situation now with an outbreak. <coughs> in Italy. Uh, there's also an outbreak in Tenerife, two areas where quite a huge number of people from Northern Ireland travel to throughout the year, uh, and uh, that would pose a significant risk uh, to uh, the people we represent. Also, uh, in terms of school trips, has there been any guidance provided? We need to seek clarity on this, Chair, uh, as to whether there's been guidance provided to principals in relation to trips already organised out of Northern Ireland two areas that potentially have faced outbreak or are at risk of outbreak. And the risk that poses not only to our students and teachers directly, but also the <coughs> consequences of that when they return home here to Northern Ireland. I have a great concern that given the pressures of our health service, Chair, that in the event of an outbreak when we are not properly prepared in advance of any potential threat, that it would put our health services, which are particularly under strain as it is, under significant pressure, 
And I think that these proactive measures, particularly throughout education and schools, uh, will help alleviate pressure and possibly avoid any mass hysteria in the event of an outbreak in any particular area. So I think there's a number of things that we really need to start uh, looking at, Chair, and posing questions to the Department, uh, to the education authorities, to what policy has been rolled out to give teachers and principals guidance to look after their students and to uh, be conscious that this is a real issue. It is spreading at a rapid rate. Lives are at risk. And if we're sending our pupils out into other countries, uh, what measures have been taken to ensure the safety of those children and also our teaching workforce and those at home when they return? Okay, thank you. Uh, Robbie, would you like to come in on this yeah, as just, well? Um, yeah. I think Daniel's point is actually uh, particularly well made. Um, given what has happened, I think it's in Tenerife where the, the infected person is actually a doctor. <coughs> and I think of the proximity yeah. that teachers and other people have to to other people's in terms of a potential spread. But um, I'm, I'm minded in terms of certainly supportive of information, but we also have to be cognizant of the pressures that schools are already under in terms of budget. So the, the point again about soaps, hand sanitizers, and face masks, I noticed that on, uh, on a news release there in some of the countries, they, they have none left because there's been panic buying. So it's about that measured response, but an appropriate response. And I think um, the points are well made and something that we should action today. Okay. So uh, as we had agreed, members, we will write to the Department of Education seeking an urgent assurance that the guidance is being provided to schools with regards to responding and preventing. Um, and we, perhaps we can add to that that if any additional resources are needed um, with regards to the services that permit prevention, um, that they're being provided as well. Um, and that supplies are in place to continue to meet that need. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm content as well that when, once we receive that response, if it's in any way deemed not adequate, that we call officials to the committee um, as soon as possible next Wednesday to speak to those matters in detail. Are members content? I, th I think, Chair, it's important to urge in any correspondence sent to the Department because I think everyone is conscious that this is a real issue. Mm -hmm. However, I think we need to strongly put weight that this must be a proactive as opposed to a reactive approach and that schools really need to be prepared now uh, uh, with, with, with the huge threat we've seen this week in terms of schools that have been in Italy, uh, the mass hysteria that's been caused even in the last 24 hours. People are panicking and worried about this. So I think that if we have or are being seen to be proactive in relation to this, it will avoid uh, that mass hysteria if or when someone said to me this morning, an outbreak does occur. Okay. I mean, obviously the measures that have been taken by schools in Northern Ireland have been deemed to be precautionary, um, and there aren't confirmed instances no. in Northern yeah. Ireland at this stage, but I think it is only right that we do seek urgent assurances on all the matters that have been raised today. And, you know, once we receive that, if, it, if we need to follow it up in any way, um, in persons, then we're happy to call officials to the committee and or to meet with them outside of next Wednesday, if that's deemed helpful as well. Thank you, Chair. Uh, happy to correspond with any schools as well that uh, feel that they have been inadequately advised or um, assisted in relation to this. Members content? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay then, members, agenda item five is our <coughs> Department of Education and Education Authority briefing on early years in child care. <coughs> I would refer members to the Clark's cover note on early years child care at page 15 of our packs, the Department of Education briefing on child care at page 30, and early years at page 36, draft child care strategy of 2015 at page 46, <coughs> Department of Education Learning to Learn Framework of October 2013 at page 112. EQI A report on EA's proposed preschool special school framework at page 168. And previous correspondence from the Department of Education on early intervention programmes and Sure Start at page 213. <coughs> Can I therefore welcome our, our officials to the committee today, Mr. Paul Brush. Director of Youth and Early Years at the Department of Education, Ms. Linda Drysdale, Head of Early Years Intervention Programme at the Department of Education, 
This is Cathy Galway, Head of Child Care Unit at the Department of Education, Tina Dempster, Child Care Unit, Department of Education, and Pat Ward, Assistant Director, Pupil Support Services and Children and Young People Services at the Education Authority. You're all very welcome today. Thanks very much indeed uh, for coming to our committee. Um, the committee has received a number of briefings from the department in recent weeks. And members greatly appreciate the written information that has provided. Um, sometimes uh, some of the presentations have been a, a little less uh, detailed or comprehensive uh, than we were hoping for. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, by our, our limited number of, of issues at today's session that we can give the department um, opportunity to, to speak to the matters at hand in, in detail. Um, so we're very glad that you're here to talk to us about the extremely important issue of childcare and early education. And um, <coughs> on another occasion, we'd be glad to come back to the detail of Sure Start uh, programmes as well. So can I invite you to make a short presentation of uh, 10 to 15 minutes and then open up for questioning. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, firstly, thank you for the invitation to cover um, this <coughs> subject of early years and childcare. Um, it is quite a wide area, um, which sort of is the reason for the number of people in front of you this morning. And um, so let me just um, reintroduce them and give you a sense of what they each cover so you get a feel for the team in front of you. My name is Paul Brush. I have sort of policy responsibility for early years. Um, and youth within the department. Uh, to my right, we've got Pat Ward, and Pat really, I suppose, is my counterpart within the Education Authority on the delivery end of things, around a lot of that child, uh, child um, education, the preschool education programme, those sorts of <coughs> issues. Then we've got two on my left from the child care unit. As you know, a specific unit was established within the department to look at the uh, potential for an extended early years child care and child education offer, and that's Cathy and Tina, and they can talk to that. And then we have Linda on my far right, and Linda is the manager for Sure Start. So while, while I know there's a separate session in Sure Start um, in a few weeks' time, it is very much part of our early years portfolio. So we're more than happy to take some questions on that this morning as well. Um, so feel free to do so. So by way of introduction, I'll give you a bit of a, an overview of some of the key developments in the early years sector over the last few years. And then I'll hand over to Cathy to talk a bit about the specific childcare uh, end of things. So, it was generally worth saying that the, the body of evidence that there is out there now for the value of investing in early years is pretty uncontested. I'm relatively new to this area of policy and I have to say I don't think I've ever worked in an area where there is such a body of evidence behind the value and the return on investment for public policy commitment. And that's international evidence. Uh, and it goes through all the stages of early years development. There's a lot of work around the first 1,000 days um, of a child's life and the importance <coughs> of brain development and language development <coughs> in, in that period. So what we're talking about is really, really important. And certainly, we, we get that within the department. The policy document that really still is the existing stated position on this is learning to learn. Now, it was uh, first produced in 2013, so it is six, seven years old, but still remains relevant. And I suppose I would like to give you a sense of some of the key developments that have taken place as a result of that policy position, and then probably point out a few of the areas that haven't progressed and where there are current challenges that we, that we need to be looking at. This was one of the main developments over that period is the fact that we now have a universal preschool child um, offer an education offer for all children in their immediate preschool year and that is uh, universally available for every child whose parents want it and we can talk a little bit about the implications of that and some of the challenges that remain even in that space. There's also been huge development in the quality of that provision 
and the Education and Training Inspectorate inspects all of that and uh, is giving very good ratings to the majority of settings. So we're not just interested in every child getting something. We want every child to get something that is quality, and that's a key uh, aspect of progress in recent years. <coughs> The admissions process for that year has just in the last couple of years gone online, so um, that has proved successful. 97% of parents applied online, and there, while there were some teething problems last year, those seem to be largely addressed this year. In terms of what children actually get in that year, there's been quite a lot of work done to develop and refine the curriculum guidance so that the preschool year is part of a continuum for the transition into P1. It's not something on its own. It's not something that we just expect to be repeated when children go into P1, but it's actually part of a foundation, part of that foundation stage. So there's been a lot of work done on in, de in determining <coughs> what sh that should look like. Of course, it's all part of the play-based um, learning approach. There's been also significant progress in the support made available to the Irish medium preschool sector and um, to build the capacity and improve the quality in this developing sector and there's support avail available through Altrum who's the current provider of that to Irish medium preschool settings. Parental engagement it's it's not all about what happens in that preschool place a lot of of the the child development literature suggests that how parents interact with their kids is as important. So a lot of what we've done in the last few years has been aimed at, I suppose, educating parents around what they need to be doing and how to do that and supporting them to do it. So the Getting Ready to Learn programme has really been quite an innovative thing where um, parents have been encouraged to come into the preschool setting. There's been various initiatives explaining to them the value of play, the value of talking to their children and the, the evidence coming out of that shows that parents are playing, reading and talking with their children much more than they were in the past. So there is useful evaluation evidence coming out. Um, one of the things um, I was here last week to talk about was this developmental review at the age of three. And I think that's part of another developing agenda, and that is how we measure all of this. There are challenges in the measurement, um, but the three plus review is a really innovative attempt to get a handle on how well we're doing. And it was that goes to another aspect of what we've been focusing on, and that is really building on the collaboration across departments. And the Three Plus Review is an excellent example of collaboration with the Department of Health. This whole early, early years agenda is not one that a single department can take forward on its own. So collaboration specifically with health is key in a whole range of areas, and we can tease out some of those as, as the morning progresses. And as well as sort of those universal provisions, we also have a suite of targeted initiatives that are aimed to support children from more disadvantaged backgrounds, to some extent to level up when they start primary school. And as well as the chief amongst those will be Sure Start, and we can talk a bit about the role and the challenges within, in that, within that programme. So what are some of the issues? Those, that's good progress that's been made, but what are some of the issues that we're currently um, addressing and going to need to address over the next year or so? Well, birth rates are falling, um, and that creates specific challenges in the sector, not least around the number of underage children going into some of those preschool settings. And while on the face of it that actually might seem like a good thing because they're getting a couple of years, it creates a lot of strain in those settings because the, the teacher is having to address um, the issues for children across a much wider developmental age span. Another area we're going to need to address is the socially disadvantaged criteria that gets applied when children are actually applying for a preschool place. It's legally 
a requirement at the moment that sp children with, from specific benefit backgrounds get prioritised. But with the rollout of universal credit, that needs to be updated because it's still based on historical benefits. So there is a clear requirement to bring that into line with where we are and where we're going, but it needs legislative change and couldn't have been done in the absence of an executive. It would be remiss of me not to mention the budget pressures that are faced in this sector as they have been across the whole department as a whole. But I think it's fair to say that the early years areas have to some extent, there's been a real attempt to minimise um, budget reductions in this area. Now, demand has been growing and in most cases the budgets, budgets haven't been but at least they haven't seen some of the cuts that have been experienced in some other areas. And I suspect that is because of the clear evidence of the need to invest here. Indeed, there's even been some modest increases in terms of the, the amount given to non-statutory preschool providers or the preschool places. This was increased a little bit in 2018-19 to take account of the increase in pressures on them. But we know that there are still challenges there, and I've visited a number of, of these preschool settings myself since just coming into the role, and they are under significant pressure, and the, the extent to which we remunerate them for those places is something that the Minister has asked us to look at. There are growing numbers of children with special needs, and this is again really manifesting itself in the preschool um, context and um, as you know significant work has been done by the education authority to look at what needs to be put in place to support those children and we can explain where that work currently stands so a lot has been done there are those are some of the big challenges but it's very much an evolving field and i think this is where i'd want to bring in kathy around what the whole um, <coughs> I suppose aspiration around a ch an extended childcare offer might look like and how it interacts with all of those things that I've just described because the objective here is to put in place something that's integrated and holistic and not just built on. So I would ask Cathy just to say a few words about, about that aspect. Okay. Thank you Chair. Um, as Paul said, uh, Tina and I are from the recently established child care unit in the Department of Education and as you will see from the briefing note, the child care strategy is being taken forward on a phased basis. <coughs> the draft strategy that was consulted on by the former OFM DFM in 2015 has dual aims, so it's child development and pr promoting parental employment. Um, and Both of those aims were broadly welcomed by everyone who responded to the consultation. Um, the 2015 draft set out a number of objectives to make childcare available, affordable, sustainable, diverse, high quality, and to allow parents to make informed choices and, as Paul said, to integrate with or complement educational and youth services. Um, it also proposed 22 interventions to meet these objectives, and a detailed analysis of the consultation <coughs> responses was undertaken and completed by DE, which we have been leading on the, finalising the childcare strategy since 2016. I've provided an overview of the main findings in your paper for today, but as you can see, generally respondents supported the vision, aims and objectives. Apart from the sustainability objective, which they felt many people felt was at odds with um, trying to promote affordability and quality, um, I think some respondents saw it as the settings becoming sustainable rather than the system of childcare being sustainable. Um, others wanted a, an increase in resources, including capital, and to ensure that all of the actions could be fully implemented, that there needed to be a dedicated resource. There were calls for commitments to an extended offer of 30 hours, similar to those in England and Wales, with some respondents highlighting the need for dedicated resources and legislation. So the childcare strategy, as you know, is an executive strategy, and therefore it requires executive consideration and approval to publish in final form. In terms of the current context and what we've been doing to update it, because that strategy went out for consultation almost five years ago, we've been working collectively with other departments, and Paul's referred to the um, collaboration with health, but our objective is to improve outcomes for children and young people in the context of Outcome 12, 
we give our children and young people the best start in life. And in the draft PFT consulted on in 2016, there was an action to extend responsive quality provision in early childhood education and care initiatives for families with children aged three to four for up to 38 weeks a year. Extensive engagement has taken place with our colleagues in the other jurisdictions to understand the early education and care offers that are available there, either the ones that are in place or those that are emerging in Scotland, they're introducing theirs um, from the autumn. I've set these out at a very high level in the briefing paper. We've actively engaged and continue to do so with colleagues in other jurisdictions through the British Irish Council Workstream for Early Years. And we work also with HMRC colleagues and locally with the Department for Communities in terms of the support and available the support available to parents through the tax and benefit system. Um, in terms of an extended offer, in other regions, the overall offer includes the existing universal early education offer available. So when um, people say there's a 30-hour offer in England, the 30-hour offer in England and Wales is only available for working parents. So in England and Wales, there's the universal preschool, which we have here, and then there's an additional hour, there are additional hours for working parents only. In Scotland, they are moving to make that available for all parents, whether they work or not. Here in Northern Ireland, we have very successful preschool programme, as Paul said, but not all parents here can access the same type of preschool session. So in terms of developing a funded early education and childcare offer for three to four-year-olds, it needs to be considered in the context of the existing universal preschool education programme. And in that context, there's an extant policy action from learning to learn to standardise patterns of attendance in preschool. And our current programme offers between 12 and a half hours a week and 22 and a half hours a week, with 40% of parents currently getting 22 and a half hours a week preschool and around 60% of parents getting 12 and a half. So we already have a system where the preschool offer is different. So when we're looking at how we would develop an extended offer, we need to think about it in that context and in the context of having an action, an agreed policy action to standardise it. There's currently no additional funded childcare for children aged three to four in Northern Ireland. So we do have a subvention scheme, but it's not a funded offer for three to four year olds for childcare. We have therefore been developing potential options for what an extended offer could be in the context of a standardised preschool offer. As you know, Chair, we have provided an overview of some illustrative options at recent meetings of the <coughs> All Party Assembly Working Group on Early Education and Childcare. By way of an example, one option could be to standardise all preschool to full time. Uh, the estimated additional cost of offering 22 and a half hours a week for children, for all children, is about between 18 million and 20 million a year, additional to the current budget for preschool. That would also include uh, an additional free school meals element for those children who would be entitled to free school meals who were uh, uh, having a longer day in preschool. We also estimate that this could require up to £20 million capital to create the capacity for the children who would usually attend afternoon sessions because our preschool programme operates, some of our uh, nurseries operate a dual day. So children come in in the morning, have their two and a half hours, go home and another set of children come in in the afternoon. A funded childcare element of around seven and a half hours per week would require between 26 and 30 million additional resource per year. So in that one example, we would need approximately 50 million pounds extra a year to fund and create and develop a 30 hour offer if that was for all families. <coughs> That's just one example. There are a number of options and there are varying degrees of how much we would need and it averages between 37 <coughs> million right up to 70, 80 million per year, depending on which option the executive decides to go for. So other options have been developed and we've been engaging directly with some early years uh, uh, settings, but we are keen to engage um, you know, further on this because we need to have a better sense of the capacity in the sector uh, the state of readiness, who could move to whatever the option is. Um, and Paul and I hope to hold <clears throat> an insight lab maybe in the coming months to discuss the implications of standardising the preschool offer in the first instance, um, if that's what the executive decide to do. All of that is subject to ministerial consideration and executive approval. So what we're looking at at the minute are options. Nothing has been decided. Okay. So in terms of updating the strategy, 
um, we will be taking account of all of the responses received to the 2015 consultation, recent developments in tax and benefits, so the priority set out in new decade, new approach, which has reaffirmed the commitment to an extended offer, and the extended early education and care services available or planned in other jurisdictions, because it's good to be able to learn from those and what's happened elsewhere. So as highlighted in the briefing paper, there are still some key policy and resourcing decisions that are required to agree the scope, the combination of ours, the eligibility and the investment required to deliver an extended offer. Whichever option is agreed cannot be funded from the existing preschool or wider education budget. Although it will require significantly more investment, that, is just, that offer is just one aspect of finalising the strategy. It has wider aspirations for childcare services for children not to, four, or not to 12 and potentially up to 14. Other proposed actions are aimed at improving the quality of provision uh, in terms of workforce development and support, uh, revising the current grant scheme and including potential for possibly a capital element, responsive and inclusive provision, so not just numbers, not just to focus on numbers of places, but on the types of places that parents require. Child care for children and parents with disabilities, disadvantaged children in rural families. Enhancements to the information and support for, for parents and how we deliver all of this in partnership. So I hope I've provided an update on how we're developing the strategy, including the offer. But at this stage, um, it's not possible to outline exactly which option will be taken because that is something that needs the executive's consideration, particularly around the budget and the resources available to deliver all of the actions. Happy to go into <coughs> answer questions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Cathy. Any other officials to present? No? Okay. But, well, thanks very much indeed for your initial uh, presentation. Um, early education and childcare in particular has been a key issue raised with me since I became an MLA in 2010. And as you've referenced, um, I also act as uh, acting chairperson of the All Party Assembly Working Group on Early Education and Child Care. And I'm sure other members will be acutely aware that the cost of child care for many families is second only to mortgage, if second um, at times now. Um, so it's an extremely important issue uh, for families across Northern Ireland and, and indeed for this committee. As you rightly alluded to as well, there is a very clear commitment in the new approach document although I'm not quite sure why the new approach document uh, refers only to three to four uh, age bands, because mm -hmm. that wasn't the tenure of the uh, debate in the mm -hmm. Programme for Government Working Group that right. contributed to the new approach document, but uh, it is what it is. Um, you also mentioned a, a lack of, of cuts in relation to some of these areas of provision. All the, the, the budget for childcare couldn't be any less to to uh, for there to actually be any cuts to it, so um, uh, you know that that's an issue in itself. Childcare strategy, uh, as you rightly say, was from 2015. I, I think the program for government commitment for a childcare strategy has dated back to 2011 mm -hmm. um, at, at least. So it, it is quite shocking that the Northern Ireland Executive does not have a fully completed childcare strategy in place. Officials were bound by the lack of ministerial authority for three years of that time period, so it, it's only right that we acknowledge that. But um, a, a key issue for us to um, address. Can I can I ask um, initially, in in terms of the uh, standardisation of of universal preschool um, provision, uh, you've you've set out the cost there. Does the department have a, a preferred option in terms of what option uh, to take for the standardisation of preschool and why why are we at a status quo where provision is so unequal across Northern Ireland? You said only 60% of parents have access to 12 and a half hours early education preschool whilst 40% have access to 22 and a half hours. Why, why has that system been allowed to develop so unequally? I, th I think it's largely historic. So whenever preschool um, was available, it was available in large full-time nurseries, statutory nursery schools. Whenever there was the preschool ed um, expansion program back in the late 90s, it expanded on a part-time basis to try and get the capacity up so that all children could access a preschool place. And over the years, 
that preschool education expansion program um, has been finding places and, and supporting the development of places in nursery units in primary schools and in voluntary and um, community playgroups. So we're now at capacity, and I think we, we, we reached the capacity that we needed in around, you know, a, around about five years ago. Um, but it developed keeping the existing full-time and developing part-time, and then there was a, a bit of a dip in the birth rate. Some of the provision converted to full-time, uh, and then Learning to Learn brought in a moratorium and any more conversions to full-time, uh, while we then had another spike in the birth rate and we needed more places. So it's largely historic, but Learning to Learn in 2013, there was a policy action to uh, standardise it. And we haven't just, we haven't been doing that. And now we've got this other policy, you know, intent, which is to develop a 30-hour offer. So now we're looking at it and saying, well, if we've got to develop a 30-hour offer and we have an opportunity to do that, and we have this extant policy action to standardise preschool, and the 30-hour offer is built around preschool, then, you know, that's an opportunity now to look at how we would standardise that, and there are a number of options to doing that, either standardising it all upwards, standardising some of it down, or equalising it 15 and 15. So they're, they're sort of the options that we've been looking at. So the, whether, whether you accessed full-time provision or not was fortune of your, your birth year and the birth it, rate, it, rather than an intentional policy and provision issue? It wasn't intentional. I think whether you can access full-time or part-time is based on where it's available at the minute. So right. um, in, in some settings, they would have only dual days. They would only have... So the whole voluntary and community <coughs> um, provision is part-time only. So they are granted to provide part-time places only. The full-time places are only available in statutory nursery schools or nursery units in primary schools. Um, but um, that's not a, a capacity issue, that's a, a funding issue. Community and voluntary sector, I'm sure, could <coughs> adjust their hours of provision if the resources were made available to them, yeah. This could be an opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can, I I, can I just one quick follow-up? Um, has research been conducted to examine what amount of hours per day is optimal? I was actually going to say something on that, actually, because I think part of the part-time, full-time, when you look at it at face value, you could conclude that people on part-time are getting something significantly less and less in an educational, developmental point of view. But the research on that has been evolving. In fact, a few, a few years ago, the sense would have been that the shorter number of hours <coughs> may have been the sort of optimal from an educational development <coughs> point of view. Now there's been some more recent research that suggests, no, in fact, a, a bit more might be the <coughs> optimal amount. So there is an evolving evidence base on this. Also important to say that the but curriculum- sure, Surely you'd, you'd want that to be a fairly uh, established uh, point of view for you and if you're making significant decisions around standardisation so have, has the department reached a position on what the optimal number of hours is? I think we're of the view that it would be difficult to take hours away and on that basis that the evidence is now suggesting that the towards the upper limit of hours is probably the more um, advantageous developmentally. It also gives the settings more time to deliver the mm -hmm. curriculum um, the, the same curriculum is delivered in a part-time day as a, a full-time day, but with some of the other pressures that I mentioned around the increasing um, challenges of SEN um, pupils, a full-time day clearly offers more opportunity to deliver that curriculum in a balanced mm -hmm. and organised way. So, so is the standardised option that you're considering standardisation to... 22 and a half hours for everyone then? That is one, that is one of the options. Um, in terms of the actual research, there, there is some research around the um, EPNI, the Effective Preschool Provision in Northern Ireland, some of that research and some of the more recent research around that, that says, you know, cognitively, as Paul said, you know, you could deliver the curriculum and cognitively they get the same offer in the 12 and a half hours per week but where there are opportunities to increase children's socialisation skills and to eat together and to maybe have more experience of outdoor play, engage with parents. You know, it, the, the, the research is, is there in parts. It's not completely, you know, you couldn't say, well, that research tells us for definite 
that this is better, but there's emerging research uh, that, you know, that could be a, a better way of delivering part of this offer potentially. Which um, is which is interesting because the Education Authority moved to reduce special school nursery provision to part time in recent years as well. So it'd be useful to uh, hear about the uh, early years framework for special educational needs in due course as well. Can I the the, the one key observation for me in relation to the, the option that has been listed not not in a way to say that it is a preferred option or a main option, but the option that you have listed, is that consistent feedback being received in relation to childcare challenges was the need for flexibility as well. So standardization of early education preschool um, to uh, presume that would be four, about four and a half, half hours, hours day. per day, mm -hmm. is in some other jurisdictions, the 30 hour provision could be taken in a flexible way acro across one or two days, for example. So is that still an option that is being considered? And can you could you respond to the departmental view as mm -hmm. to whether or not that flexibility is as important to the department as it seems to be to families, particularly working families that are trying to balance childcare with part-time work as well? Well, because whatever offer um, is available for three to four year olds will build on the existing preschool offer. Um, the one option, of course, is to keep the status quo, where we, we continue with the 12 and a half hours and, and provide an additional funded 17 and a half hours around that. You know, that is another option that we're looking at. But consistently, in terms of the preschool education programme, a lot of the correspondence that the department would get is around, well, why am I only getting 12 and a half hours early education? when other parents can get 22. So it wouldn't solve the issue of not having a standardised preschool day. Um, and there's not an awful lot of flexibility in terms of it's delivered five days a week, 38 weeks a year in, in line with term time. Um, but parents could opt, you know, if it, it depends the additional hours of childcare, we wouldn't stipulate that they have to be delivered in the same setting. So there would be uh, some flexibility around when they take the... So if the option of 22 and a half hours was adopted, they could take the seven and a half hours and use it at any you know at any time and use any, any registered provider. That, that's the thinking at the minute. These are all illustrative options. Okay, keen to bring other members in as well. So can I uh, invite Daniel McCrossan? Uh, thank you for your presentation, Cathy and Paul also, and welcome to the other uh, uh, guests, to the witnesses to the committee. Um, these are important matters and long rumbled on with uh, the need for a resolution to some of them and some of the biggest challenges for working families is around childcare. And the chair has rightly um, expressed uh, the difficult circumstances that families find themselves in at the end of the month in terms of a mortgage and childcare and then everything else after that. But before I, I focus on some of the presentations, I, I would just like some clarity because I know that Pat Ward is the Assistant Director uh, pupil from Pupil Support Services and also Children and Young People Services for the Education Authority. And there's just two matters, Pat, maybe you'd clarify for me. One is, is uh, special education still under the Children and Young People's Services Directorate of EA, or has it been moved recently? And secondly, has there been changes in the senior leadership of the Children and Young People Services at EA in recent days? Um, what I can tell you is that special education is still under Children and Young People's Services. Um, there have been changes in the recent weeks in terms of the management responsibilities within CYPS. Um, those changes are something that have been taken forward by the EA corporate leadership team. Um, at present, whilst I can confirm that special education is still under CYPS, the management arrangements are different for special education. Um, any further information, I think, would be um, something for the corporate leadership team in EA to take forward, because I know that they've already reported through this committee that they have conducted an audit and um, I know that there have been some uh, c consideration of that audit and in terms of sharing it with members. Thank you. Uh, they, for they, they, <coughs> they, uh, they reported an audit. They, yeah. they didn't report changes to uh, senior management responsibilities, but I'll let Daniel proceed. Chair, I know without getting into any detail or putting anyone in a difficult situation that there's been significant changes to the leadership of CYPS 
and there really needs to be some transparency around why those changes took place, what led to those changes, what exactly are those changes, um, and um, uh, who took those decisions as well. And I think it's important that um, in light of some of the huge challenges around this particular area, uh, that, that that information is shared with this committee uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and I, I can say without naming anyone, Chair, that a senior member has been removed, someone that's very well known within this area, and we need to have clarity as to why that has happened. If I can confirm that I will feed that back to our um, corporate leadership team and ask that they come back to the committee with um, clarification in that regard. Thank you. Chair, do you want to go on with that? No, we do. Right? Yeah, just uh, in relation to uh, the presentations, uh, the two aims of the child care strategy are, are very good. Um, child development and, pre and parental employment. Uh, has there been any measurement of how effective uh, we've been at, ach at achieving the aims of that, and particularly around the employment one? Has it helped parents get back to work anyway? I think some of the feedback we've had from the other jurisdictions where this offer is in place is that whilst you can't make a direct comparison between you know, so many people going into employment, what it has done and in terms of them, in Wales in particular, they have asked parents, you know, what, what has this enabled you to do? For many people, it has enabled them to go back to work. For some, it has enabled them to take on additional work or to apply for promotion or to uh, undertake training and development opportunities or work different or longer hours. So there is some feedback in, in terms of the other jurisdictions that it has removed the barriers that might have been there. Um, but it is going to be quite hard to directly attribute a childcare strategy with in, you know, upta improved uptake in the labour market. Okay. And, and in relation to that, in terms of measuring whether it's been a success or not, that is from <coughs> parents who went back to work, I'm assuming? Yeah, so parents um, availing of the offer. Yeah. So they've been asking parents availing of the offer, and there are a number of ways where we could measure improved outcomes in this, because one outcome will be a direct you know, qualitative indicator of, of increased uptake, but in other, in other jurisdictions they've been measuring the outcomes for the families directly in terms of what it has done for them at a personal level, what it has done for their income, um, what it has done to enable them to work a more flexible um, work life, have a, a more flexible work life balance, and actually to uh, apply for different things that you know would enable them to go for promotion or to work longer hours. So it is self-reporting from parents in some cases. Um, uh, obviously, they do have figures. Uh, we could check whether they have any direct figures in terms of um, labour market increases, but it is going to be difficult to make that direct case. Thank you. And, Chair, if just another moment. Okay. Of the 22 interventions identified, um, have we attained the objective of one place for every three children? And what alternative rural models uh, have you come up with? Uh, and how effective are these models and have all children with disabilities been catered for uh, as intended in that regard? No, um, so uh, there were, as, as I said at the start, this was sort of a developing, this was developed on a phased basis, this strategy, and um, the first 15 actions in the Bright Start um, created, um, aimed to create additional places. Um, the Bright Start Subvention Scheme has created, sustained or maintained um, around 2,500 places. Um, its aim was, I think, 7,000. Um, but there is a bit of an issue there because it counts disadvantaged areas, rural areas and childcare on the skills state <coughs> can all be the same thing. So there's an element of that where we're not sure, you know, in terms of you could be double counting some of it. Um, it could be in a rural area on a school state and disadvantaged as well. So it didn't it didn't meet the seven thousand target. Um, but that's not to say that it hasn't been really successful in terms of what it has enabled settings to do. Um, but it is a subvention scheme. It's not funded places. It's just helping to fund and, and offset the costs. Um, in terms of disability, there's a, a holiday grant scheme. Mm -hmm. The Department of Health runs a holiday grant scheme for, children, for disabled children. Um, and it is funded through the Bright Start funding that is currently. Um, um, they support about 10 settings, I think, was last year's figures, um, about 288 children over that, that summer scheme period. Okay. Uh, 
the figures that we been striking. So two two and a half thousand. Very brief, Daniel. We're going to take yeah, seven yeah. seven thousand was the target. Why the yeah. tune? So they, they they said the the Bright Start scheme. Um, there was like three areas that it would support disadvantaged families mm -hmm. and disadvantaged areas. It would be in rural areas or it would be in school states. So we we fund by two and a half thousand places, but we're counting places. But you could have one place that's in a rural area on a school serving disadvantaged families. So we don't count that as three because it actually mm -hmm. is only one place. So you're never going to meet. The seven thousand, you know, you could be in five or six thousand, but we don't want to double count. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is actually places created or sustained mm -hmm. was two and a half thousand. But if you actually say, well, you'll count <coughs> one place in a disadvantage, then you'll count the same place as mm -hmm. meeting the rural needs. Then you know you could extrapolate that up, but it would be double counting. And some settings, some settings have become sustainable over the time and have dropped out now of the scheme. Um, I think the key thing that it, it raises for us, though, and it came through in the responses to the consultation, having a target that is purely quantitative actually is, is not really that meaningful because what respondents to the consultation said is, you know, don't word your interventions or your actions in terms of creating X amount of places for this type of provision. Actually just have responsive provision that meets the needs in the, in the community or at a regional level, you know, have more of a sense of what the actual need is in an area rather than, if you like, creating a number of places in anticipation that they're going to be needed. It would be much better to focus <coughs> on the quality of the place, on the type of place, and have a better sense of what the need is because, um, you know, it is just that was just a subvention scheme, very important subvention scheme, and Tina and I have had lots of feedback from settings saying it was essential to them at the time to make it more affordable for, for parents in the area. But I think we would we would keep we would not have targets like that, quantitative targets in this in this revision in the in the revised strategy. Chair, can I have a wee brief moment? It's Very just quick. one other question. Uh, uh, thank you for that as well. Uh, why do you think that eighty percent of parents are doing the first preference choice is a high percentage? And surely the aim should be 95% plus. Is this on the preschool yeah. program? Okay, so it's, it's around 80, 87% yeah. um, yeah. uh, <coughs> for a uh, first preference place. Well, it's, it's probably because you'll never be able to meet the exact first preferences with the number of places available. So an awful lot of settings are yeah. oversubscribed. Yeah. Um, and when they're oversubscribed, then the parents go down to their next choice. But I think at stage one, it's around 95% yes. of parents okay. get a place yeah. in, in one of their preferred yeah. settings. That is actually quite high, and mm -hmm. it has actually increased uh, over recent years. And it is about the fluctuations in need in particular wards, in particular areas, and it's about having that flexibility. Um, if you couldn't possibly um, provide first preference to every parent for their child, it would be impossible to do so. So I, I believe that 86 is, mm -hmm. is quite high. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Daniel. Morris Bradley. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we're having a presentation first start in March <coughs> and extended schools in April, so I'll, I'll not dwell on that there. But it's in relation to the funding. We had the budget yesterday. How uh, confident are you that you have the funding even to maintain the status quo? Uh, even if, as you, if you say, Cathy, you were to go for a, a, an all preschool option, that's an extra £50 million you need. Mm -hmm. Are you sure you can draw that down? How do you go about that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, short answer. Um, so the, what, what's happened is it has been identified as pressure. So it's included in the overall pressures that the department has identified and it will be a matter then for the executive to decide on the priorities. Um, for spending, but it is included in the pressures. So I think for the next three years, we've identified pressures, potential pressures of 15, then 30, then 45 over the next three years. So if um, if the executive agree and, and commit to an extended offer, it will do so on the basis of the money must be available to support it because it isn't available in the department's um, current budget or something else would have to stop. In, in, the, in, the, in the department's um, current budget to allow, to allow us to pay for that. We don't have baseline for childcare at all. So even the money that comes to pay for the Bright Start Subvention Scheme comes from central funds. The DE doesn't have any budget at all for childcare. The preschool budget is around about 57, 58 million per year. Uh, so the additional money required to implement this extended offer once the executive agreed 
um, what it is, is they will agree it on the basis of this is how much it costs to deliver it. So it's a pressure at the minute. Uh, and I guess the, the budget position for everything else, excluding the sort of childcare bit, is simply assuming the status quo. So there are pressures that would be that would necessitate increases in some areas, like Sure Start is, is an example. So um, the budget bid, the department at this stage assumes a status quo allocation based on the, the table you'll have received within your briefing bag. But even at that, is the finance adequate for the status quo? Well, there are definitely pressures, um, and you know the, the pressures are around areas like sure start provision and the growing demand, and the fact that um, we need to review how we're targeting and where we're targeting because there's more up to, there's now more up to date um, information on the multiple deprivation measures. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are wards that we, um, if we were applying that more up to date methodology, we would want to provide sure start provision and that would have a cost implication. There are undoubtedly cost implications around the SEN, special educational needs enhancements that the education authority would, will be bringing forward in due course. So it's very much a budget position to maintain what is there, but what is there in some cases is will not be adequate to address some of the pressures that we know mm -hmm. are already in the system. Mm -hmm. Dorian, through you, Chair, just one, one yeah, question. Yeah, go ahead, Marsh. You, had, you, you mentioned it yourself there, but areas of deprivation, have, have you managed to increase from 20% to 25% coverage in some of those areas? Do you want to take that one? Yes, um, that, that expansion has completed, so we're now delivering Sure Start in uh, at least the 25% uh, most disadvantaged areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Of course, thank you. Uh, Catherine Kelly. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm sorry I had to leave in the middle of it. Um, and I apologise if some of this has already been answered. Um, for me, um, childcare in rural areas, um, especially west of the Ban, and in particular for Mana and Oma, um, is very, very little. There's very little provision um, because it's largely rural. Um, and I think that we need to see, um, especially when you talk about today's current climate with universal credit, um, we need to ensure that there is an alignment with the previous um, executive strategies and frameworks um, to ensure that childcare um, isn't, doesn't become a barrier um, to people who have, because we know that um, the payment is only every five weeks um, and the childcare provider needs that payment up front. Um, so families, parents are constantly um, in, de in debt um, and it doesn't, and especially too when we see the closure of the childcare voucher scheme, um, which was um, crucial to a lot of working families. Um, I've just a couple of questions. Um, will there be a consultation um, on the revised strategy? Um, and what would the time scales be? Um, and who would the consultation be with? Um, and taking into account that the, the ministerial and executive consideration of the budget and resources um, has to be um, looked at as well. So um, it's, uh, it's 2015 this was consulted on, the, the, the strategy, but at that time <coughs> there, there wasn't an action in that, in that draft for an extended offer. Um, the extended offer was consulted on, though, in terms of having an extended offer as part of the 2016 programme for government, um, and that was, you know, uh, welcomed um, by most people. I think w what we're looking at is in in taking a finalised um, strategy to the executive for approval. The minister is updating everything in terms of the consultation responses from the 2015 draft issues in the two you know the references in the 2016 program for government and the new decade new approach um, if there was legislation required then obviously that would go through the legislative process which requires um, consultation but um, in terms of whether they want to go back out again to another consultation on the childcare strategy saying this has been in development since 2011 um, you do wonder about the 
you know, how how welcome that would be out in the sector. I think where where we're looking at now, and that's a decision, you know, for the, the you know for the executive. But what we're looking at is in terms of how we would implement whatever that extended offer is going to be. That would require significant engagement and almost into a co-design, um, you know, process because the whole childcare strategy has been taken forward on a co-design basis with um, lots of engagement and lots of workshops. So it's a balance between do we want to go back out again and reopen you know, some of the things that have been consulted on so many times, but there is an issue in terms of is the system ready to uh, deliver whatever this extended offer is going to be and what will it look like and how long will it take? Because this is not something that even if the executive agreed this next week it could be put in place the week after in the other jurisdictions whenever the policy um remit was clear it has taken three to four years for the actual implementation to happen because of the the way the sector would need to respond so i think that's why we would like mm. to do the uh the innovation. insight the innovation lab which came through the all-party group um to try and get a sense of what are the implications, what are the risks, what what logistically, you know, do we need to be thinking about? Because a lot of this is a concept at the minute, um, and we need to get into well, what what are the risks? And our key focus will always be not destabilising the preschool education programme in in whatever um, comes through, because that has been and is so successful, and it has something like ninety four percent uptake at the moment. So um, there are a lot of questions, Catherine. So in terms of whether the executive wants to go back out on a consultation, you'd have to think about, you know, well, how, what will we, what, what would we all get from that? But I think there is a need for a very specific engagement in terms of implementation of whatever this offer is going to be. I think too, there's amazing work done by the likes of employers for childcare mm -hmm. and parenting mm -hmm. NA yes. and others who. Um, for the past five years well, and longer, mm -hmm. have been um, carrying out the surveys um, with the relevant mm -hmm. stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, and that's all there. Um, yeah. And from that, we can see how um, how much in crisis our childcare system is, and how much pressures there are on families. Mm -hmm. um, just another um, weak question. Um, Bright start, Kathy. You mentioned it. Um, in um, when the minister and the department are, are looking at the childcare strategy um, afresh and, and as you are, are doing at the minute, um, Bright Start has been crucial um, in a lot of, a lot of um, areas um, and it was initially a three year pilot. Mm -hmm. Where does it stand in a revised strategy? <coughs> will it still be available or will there be something brought in to replace it and to replace I suppose the the negatives of it um, mm -hmm. that that weren't working well. Mm -hmm. I mean that was the um, Jane will say a bit about the current bright start in a minute and what the plans are. But in terms of the responses to the consultation and the feedback we have had from, we have been engaging um, during this period with um, a, a wide range of stakeholders. The, the bright start is a subvention scheme. It was a pilot and that pilot has continued on in the absence of uh, an agreed executive strategy um, when when we look at the responses and when we say it, we're thinking well there probably is still a need for something because the three to four offer is just for that age range the the other age ranges all need some form of support as well and particularly coming through the responses where there's nothing for not to choose and um, so uh, our, when we've been you know drafting uh, the, the revised strategy we have been looking at the need for a continued scheme of some sort but again it all comes down to resources and you know what money will be available for it but um, we have been um, continuing to fund the bright start in the absence of an executive strategy do you want to say a wee bit? Yeah I mean <coughs> we are aware the health and social care board are the managing agent for that scheme on our behalf and they in turn subcontract to Playboard NI who are the delivery agent and as you know bright start is from 4 to 14 it is just school age so, yeah, there are lessons learned to be coming mm -hmm. through from that, and we do engage with Playboard, with mm -hmm. the Health and Social Care Board, um, to look at where there was some failings in, in that scheme that was put in place and where what worked well. Um, so there is an in, there is an interim evaluation that had, was carried out, um, and currently there is a case study review on successful cases and also the lessons learned that we would need to take on board and look into the future. Thank you. Okay, Catherine. Thank you, Robin Newton. 
Thank you, Chair. <coughs> I thank Mr. Brush and his team uh, for, for coming. I was delighted at least to hear all those positive words about investment in education rather than cost of education. As I hope I made the point on Monday that uh, you know if we don't invest in, particularly in this area of our young people, that the cost to the other departments as we as they go through their life is, is going to be greater. And if, if we <coughs> do invest um, as much as possible, and um, when the minister makes his <coughs> final bid, and you guys prepare the bid, uh, I hope I would speak for the committee that uh, you would have the support of the committee in, in, in that investment programme. Can I just ask you a, a couple of short questions, uh, Mr. Chairman? Um, uh, Mr. Brush made reference to the historical benefits analysis, which has, and I find uh, parents who are working actually find it difficult to get places because, uh, could you perhaps expand on what might be the route out of that situation? Uh, and indeed, could I, I find it difficult to understand um, the development of a CPD program for early years practitioners, um, that no work has been done in, in that area. I would have thought that that was kind of just primary work that would go on on a day-to-day -day basis as opposed to specific work. Um, Yes, so the, the point, your first point around the socially disadvantaged circumstances criteria, am I I'm understanding it right that the sense is that it discriminates against working parents? Yeah. Yes. Like, I suppose we, we are where we are in terms of what the legislation um, says, and the legislation is a product of the historical context in which we find ourselves back when there wasn't universal provision. There weren't enough spaces for everyone. So the evidence very much was there that uh, children from disadvantaged backgrounds most importantly needed to be prioritised in getting this year of preschool. So the criteria um, at that stage, quite rightly, I think um, everyone would agree, prioritised the children from backgrounds who needed it most. We're in a different context now. There is a place for everyone who wants it, albeit not necessarily their first <coughs> preference place, as, as already mentioned. Um, we also have a, an imperative to change this, as I mentioned, because we're moving to universal credit. So the legislation as it stands actually quotes benefits that are disappearing before our eyes and people are moving to universal credit. So we need to do something. So the question is, what do we do here? Um, one option would be to, um, I suppose, replace the current legislation with um, a new criteria that continued to prioritise children from socially disadvantaged backgrounds as near as possible to what used to be the case. That would prove difficult because universal credit is a much sort of broader catch-all category. Or we still recognise the need for some prioritisation, but we would want to bring within that um, children from families who are working but on low incomes, the, perhaps the sort of um, challenges that you describe. And the sort of criteria that you might use in that situation would be the free, something like the free school meals criteria, which has a sort of income threshold, but it very much also targets um, lower paid working families or you could decide that actually now that we have enough provision for everybody you don't need this criteria at all there isn't criteria like this for primary schools or secondary schools having said that preschool remains um, it's not a compulsory thing to do so you uh, whereas going to primary school or at least being educated is um, at that point so these are factors that the minister is clearly going to be taking into consideration. He has already indicated that it is in, his intention to update the legislation in hopefully in time for the next intake. But which of those sort of factors play out is still under his consideration. 
CPD for the... Oh, yes, the CPD. Um, well, this, the whole sort of workforce development in the preschool context is one that has not been as well progressed as some of the other commitments in, in learning to learn. And indeed, it's an area where we, at the moment we have a, a transformation project within the department looking at those bits that just haven't progressed um, as well as others. And I think the focus up until now has been about getting enough provision in place, but the, the focus changes to what does quality look like and how can we even maximise the value of the provision that we now have in place. And that's where, you're absolutely right, the attention needs to turn to workforce development, um, continuous professional development, the skilling process. And all of these things are bound up in what Cathy was describing in terms of it sort of is a bit of a game changer. If we go to this extended offer and we have a mix of preschool and childcare, wrapped around that there would need to be a workforce development component. So we're very much looking at, well, how would we take forward that action in the context of where this policy might mm -hmm. take us. Do you want to say anything? Or and um, that would have to be taken forward in collaboration with the Department of Health, um, because they register and inspect all of the um, the, the daycare and preschool non-statutory preschool settings. But while there hasn't been um, a very specific CPD program, there has been developments in terms <coughs> of how staff can avail of other opportunities. So, as part of learning to learn. Um, We've implemented some cluster arrangements at, at early years level where, uh, you know, a bit like learning leaders where they actually learn from each other and cluster and, and we've supported that and there's a, a, a pilot um, cluster established and that has been just recently inspected by the ETI and, and evaluated, evaluated by the ETI and that will be moving forward in terms of how we expand on that. So that's in place. As well as that, Paul had referred to the Getting Ready to Learn, the Getting Ready suite of programmes, which has... You know, as a byproduct, improved staff confidence in terms of engaging with parents and supported settings to do a bit more work in terms of engagement with parents and how they work on children's overall development and the collaboration again with health. So whilst we haven't got something that's called a CPD programme, there has been elements of progress that have enabled staff to do more <coughs> and to learn more and develop their skills. Um, but I think we do need to take it now in the round between early years and childcare. And it's something that the childcare strategy has identified in terms of how we develop the workforce, how we um, how we develop the workforce, how we um, show that we value the workforce and how we support the workforce in some form of career progression and improvement. Um, because um, that has come through very clearly in, in the consultation around how they feel valued and supported and how as a as a sector they don't feel you know that their status is clear or understood yeah. um, can, if i can just come in there in, in terms i think it's important in relation to your your question robin um the ea early years sen early years inclusion service does have a capacity building program for settings um, that is available on our website and settings can actually enroll on the various training programs via the website and that is followed up with evaluation um, so that has been rolled out consistently across the ea over the last two years and it has now been opened up um, to include non-statutory peg settings um, so at, at some later point i could share with you exactly what those different uh, training programs are and uh, as of now the evaluations for those um, trainings are actually very, very positive. So that's something that we in EA are, are endeavouring to develop and provide more of that training and actually bring about a blended offer, which also <coughs> more online training as a follow-up mm -hmm. to the face-to-face -face training. So that is something that has mm -hmm. been developed in relation to SEN. Mm -hmm. And PACE4 has sharing mm -hmm. from the start. There, there, there's various aspects mm -hmm. of programmes and initiatives that um, have actually developed staff, but mm -hmm. um, we don't have a Northern Specific, Ireland yeah. strategic yeah, I, I approach. I guess just the difference between staff development and continuing yes. professional development. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I just would want when would you think that, that it's, it's a piece of work not done when would you think it will be done 
Well, I think it, the, a lot of these things are now bound up yes. with whether we can move forward and how quickly we can move forward with the sort of childcare piece that Cathy described. Okay. So, to, to the extent that it's going, <coughs> we won't wait forever mm -hmm. um, if it emerges that the budget um, isn't available for some of, of, of what Cathy was describing. But I think that we are at a, a, a real juncture now where it would make sense to wait and see what happens. Do, can we secure the budget to, to, for this expansion? Mm -hmm. And if we can, it should be part of that. <coughs> and the other actions in the <coughs> strategy, you know, so it's not just about the three to four offer, it's the whole package of the, of the actions in the strategy. And, and a, a big focus is on workforce development and not just the childcare workforce, but the integrated early years and childcare workforce. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Deputy Chair, Karen Moore. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. There is so much, and I, we're not even getting to touch on it all today. So I'm going to try um, and get this to flow, just picking up on, on some of the um, uh, previous contributors. Firstly, I suppose I want to say before I start um, that um, I want to commend the work of A's preschool unit over the last number of years. I have seen um, a vast improvement, particularly with the online, um, in terms of the provision and, and getting young and children placed, where we would have had a vast number of parents coming to us that is reduced. So we are, I suppose, moving in the right direction. But I do want to pick up on one of the things you were, Paul, you were saying about the factors for the minister. And I know it's been said a number of times this morning about maybe parents not getting their first preference. And it's not just as simple as parents choosing somewhere because that's what they like and they want to go. We still do have, um, and there's areas where it's not consistent and there's not equity of access. We have communities in, here in the north where um, uh, parents are expected up, to travel up to seven miles, and that's, you know, that's called provision. Um, many of these families are on low incomes, they don't have access to a car, so there is, there is uh, uh, children sitting at home and we've heard and we know about the benefits um, of uh, preschool provision and, and Cathy highlighted so many of them. That brings me on to my next point and Paul had touched on about community and voluntary uh, nurseries. Um, uh, one of our preschool units got in touch with me this week and they've been operating for 25 years and in my constituency in an area of high deprivation and they're looking at closure. Um, uh, I feel over and this, and it's been touched on today, this has been due to a uh, lack <coughs> of funding and investment um, and I also believe, you know, in, in, in those cases as well, just a lack of support. Somebody who comes from a community background and whose children accessed um, any of these groups when, when we we couldn't get on to the strategy. Um, the benefits that, that my children, but also as parents that we get, um, that comes from it. So it is looking likely that um, this group um, will close um, after 25 years, which leaves in, in uh, my constituency and ours, very little community and voluntary play groups or preschool settings left. Um, so it's a really worrying concern. And uh, I suppose that brings, us, brings me on as well around Bright Start funding. I know we got an, an update here. Um, Bright Start <coughs> funds a number of after schools clubs. Yeah. And in some areas um, of high, high deprivation, there may only be one that is funded. If Bright Start is removed, that after school will go. So we are looking at the majority of households ex experiencing child poverty are working households on low incomes. So we're going to possibly lose after schools, summer schemes, and then what those clubs also provide, as we know, is not the educational, physical, uh, mental health, social activities, all of that that's there. It's not just there to provide childcare for the parent, the child comes first. So we are looking at, um, if there's not something to replace, we will be looking at communities, the most disadvantaged <coughs> communities and parents on the lowest income. Um, and those children will possibly be facing no after school as well. So I wanted to just sort of ask, you know, just listening to the presentations and as I say, there's so much more. Um, you know, as the direction of travel in terms of uh, childcare being looked at more as a direction through formalised 
preschool rather than an, ins an inclusive model of all childcare settings? You know, it's very, it's very much mixed. So, um, in terms of the offer, so uh, the offer, I think there's an awful lot of focus on the offer. Um, but w when we're looking at finalising the strategy for executive consideration, um, it's the wider offer of childcare. So it's from not to 12, potentially up to 14. And whilst they, whilst settings can only be registered up to 12. Um, age 12 for a child. I think there was some feedback around, well, could we not use some of our after schools or youth facilities in terms of how we would provide services even for some older children or for children with a disability? You know, their needs are going to go beyond age 12. So we're looking at it in the round. And um, what, what, what I would say about the 30 hour offer is it is going to be based around the existing preschool education system. So that's our, that's that's our universal offer. It's already available. The infrastructure's there. It's been built up over all of these years. So that aspect of it will continue in terms of a preschool curriculum-led um, qualified staff delivering that preschool education curriculum. Everything else around that is going to be, there's going to be a real focus on quality, how we ensure the quality of the provision in the childcare setting, but not necessarily curriculum-led, but some form of quality framework or play-based framework, you know, where the children just aren't there and being looked after and in best practice settings that wouldn't be the case yeah. anyway. So although they have to meet minimum standards t to meet the registration criteria, many of them are all <coughs> beyond that and Playboard has a real role in that in terms of supporting how the settings operate. What we would like to see though is whatever goes forward as the, as the overall offer for childcare, there will be a a real focus on the quality of the provision and supporting the workforce to, to be able to deliver that quality, but not necessarily with a, a very specific formal education pro um, focus. No, it will be that holistic view of education where the child's overall social and emotional development, play, be, uh, pl experiences of play and all of that is included. It won't be something that is curriculum led for all of the hours that the child is in that setting. But in the preschool, it will still remain the preschool education curriculum, even if it goes beyond 20, if it goes to 22 and a half hours, because currently 40% of our children are getting their preschool education curriculum in a 22 and a half hour session. Okay. Thank you. okay. Could, but, could, could I just yeah. pick up on a point you'd made, Karen, about the, uh, the setting that's uh, experiencing difficulty? Yeah. Um, there is the potential, Sorry, if there are strategically important settings, and by that I mean really very little else in the area, and them coming out would create a real gap, um, there is the potential for those settings where they are f experiencing significant financial difficulty and are at risk to contact the education authority, and there is support available in that very specific context is that yes that's right if i could add to that if the setting is strategically important uh, so we, we we have contacted this week and as i say we have a good working relationship with yes. the staff as you know it's it's just it has been you know i've been told there's other provision in the area what happens is parents will choose the full time first mm -hmm. and then the part time and as i say you know this is run by part-time member staff and volunteers and and it, it's it's just for me it's an, it's one of the very few that is left in Derry and if it goes and I'm sure it's the same for other people yeah. um, when we're looking at it uh, and it's just been the years and years and they've held on as long as they can they've been told they'll be funded <coughs> next year if they get this but they probably couldn't hold on the next year so um, we can take yeah. it off. Yes, I, I'm, I'm aware of, of the setting and, and, and yeah. I have, have had a look at the correspondence. So, Karen, I'm happy to take that up with you afterwards. Just, and just a small point, I know we're going to cover it in the next uh, was, you know, we talk about sure starting provision and all. And again, the, the area that I live in, the neighbourhood renewal area, with um, uh, some of um, the, you know, the wards on that, the top 10%. There's 60 places awarded for sure start and over 200 children apply each year so mm -hmm. you know and i know that has been increased we'll pick it up later but you know there is a real and then if we see the community play groups closing down that's where you know so it all has a knock on of it, a, effect the one thing i would say um, is that it <coughs> depending on what option is it is um, chosen for the 30 hour 30 hour offer the extended offer we don't have the capacity at the minute in the preschool system to deliver that so um, 
there will be opportunities mm -hmm. um, for uh, settings, hopefully, to be able to absorb some of the capacity issues that, or to be able to address some of the uh, yeah. capacity issues that we have. So there are opportunities if we go to this 30 or offer obviously for children and for parents, but also for settings who could then find themselves in the position where they could offer to um, take up some of the um, some of the capacity issues and address some of those. Thanks. Thank you. William Humphrey. Thanks very much, Chairman. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, could I just make the point, returning to the, one of the issues that Mr uh, Newton raised, in terms of early intervention being more, more cost effective uh, and also more effective for young people in terms of their education and even across life. Whenever Robin raised the issue of um, access, Mr. Bruce, you, you came back and said socially disadvantaged children from socially disadvantaged backgrounds. I would just make the point, that, and I represent one of the most deprived constituencies in the United Kingdom, but I would make the point that those children uh, can come from um, working families as well. And a decision, an ideological decision taken by a minister before in a previous mandate or previous, previous mandates that have continued is just fundamentally not fair on those families. And so when it comes to the review, I think it's very important that uh, you remember those working families and that their children get the same uh, opportunity as those who come from the so, what you call socially disadvantaged because some of the parents who get up every morning go to work to live in, uh, and, and, and unfortunately be in low-income jobs that are in socially disadvantaged families as well. Um, there's been some talk about a um, number of occasions about the Department of Health and working collaboratively between yourselves, and I very much welcome that. But I've heard no mention, particularly around early years, of the Department of Food Communities. Is there any collaborative work goes on between yourselves and the Department of Communities around these issues? Because I would have thought particularly around early years, that it would be hugely important that there is. So in terms of childcare, um, we have a cross-departmental programme board and the Department for Communities are represented on that. Um, we would also engage with the Department for Communities in terms of universal credit and what's happening um, and because many of the childcare settings are saying that they aren't getting paid. Uh, for their child care and it's because of the issues with universal credit so we have been engaged with um, DFC colleagues on that and there hopefully will be a way of um, trying to explore that and, and address some of those issues um, in the finalised strategy because they have they have taken on board some of the issues now they would say the department would say well everybody is being paid in, in the time scales that they need to be but I think it's about that sort of paying in advance for child care and then getting the money you know, there's there's some issues around that and i think they have made um there has been adjustments in terms of landlords so landlords i think are now paid rent for, um and i know our dfc colleagues are keen um to explore this in, in terms of what can be done so they are aware of the issues with universal credit and child care settings and they are represented on the on the cross departmental board but apart from the cross-departmental board, and I welcome the issues around the, the, the benefit situation, that there's a collaboration, is the department putting any money into to, to the provision mm -hmm. of early years? Mm -hmm. Yes. We, in addition to the board that Cathy described, there's a project that I've referred to around sort of looking at how all departments are investing in the early years and are we as joined up as we need to be and just looking at what we're all doing and the department of communities is on that project and yes they are putting some money in they're not nearly as big a player as D we would be or health would be they're the definitely the biggest players but some money is going in under neighborhood renewal initiatives oh. um, some of which is targeted at early years activity so there very much is an awareness of the need to work together on that. Um, we do have sight of neighbourhood <coughs> renewal proposals when they're considering them and have an opportunity to comment on the alignment integration with the wider early years offering. So there is a degree of join up there, mm -hmm. whether it's as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. You're working, you're working yeah. to make it as good as it could be. Well, I think in fact, all of all of those joins will come under an increasing spotlight through 
the children and young people strategy and the absolute requirement to connect all our activities in this not to four space <coughs> to an even greater extent. Okay. In terms of the um, EA uh, review and consultation of 2018, there's considerable mention in that document in the papers that we have in front of us about special educational needs. Uh, a few weeks ago we met the um, representative body of special educational needs. When it comes to the, whether the department or the EA and taking professional advice, where does, where does the EA or the department take that professional advice from around special educational needs? In terms of EA, um, within the EA itself, within the Children and Young People Services Directorate, um, we would have a range of uh, practitioners and officers who would have years of experience working in special educational needs. Um, again, as a matter of course, <coughs> the EA Psychology Service would engage in research in terms of continuously updating their repertoire of knowledge in terms of how best to address special education needs by um, conducting research in relation to a number of areas. I think, I think those members who were at that particular briefing mm -hmm. would perhaps agree with me that the impression that we got and were clearly given was that in terms of the professional advice that is given or taken by the Department of the EA isn't the same as it would be perhaps uh, in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Barry Carpenter report, I think it was 2015, um, why is there no recourse to taking advice from people who are internationally renowned, nationally accepted and appreciated as being experts? Why, why does Northern Ireland not take that advice? Well, I have to say, SEND sits in a different directorate within DE, but I'm more than happy to take you know, the challenge. I accept that, and yeah, I suspect you might come back and say that, but it's, <laughs> it's heavily, it's heavily it's mentioned in it this is. paper. It is. Yes. Yes. So it's entirely appropriate that I ask you yep. that and yep. your yep. colleague that question. Yep. 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 And the paper mm -hmm. is a consultation document yes. that the Education Authority put out, mm -hmm. and I suppose yeah. Pat is describing the expertise that they have taken on board mm. in developing it. When it comes to the department... But I did say in terms of both EA and the department? Yes, so as, as what I'm saying, when it comes to the department, um, I will be very much relying on my colleagues who are the sort of division responsible for special educational needs to assess, advise and assure me. So you, you're confident that you have expertise within your department to, to give that, ex that advice? I, I'm, I'm, I don't know um, is the answer. I would expect they will I, rely I on the expert advice. I'll finish with this. I think the impression we were left with by those, those principles was that that professional advice was coming from civil servants and not being taken by those who are actually experts in the field. And I'm simply saying to you that if that is the case, <coughs> if that is the case, I don't think anything you've said here today in terms of the department it gives me reassurance that it's not the case. And I think it's about time that the department started to look at, at, at that sort of um, professional, um, and I may use the term educated, uh, advice around these issues. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, William. Uh, just a few uh, closing questions from myself, unless any other members want uh, brief supplementaries. Uh, which departments are represented on the, the Child Care Strategy Programme Board? Um, Department for Communities, Department of Health, uh, the Executive Office, the Economy. Economy. Okay. Yeah. They are, they are all there then, yeah? They're, they're all there. Okay. Yes. And ha has there been any consideration of the pooling of budgets for child care provision, given the pooled outcomes achieved by good child care provision? Yeah, I think in terms of whenever we have a finalised strategy, we'll need to look at um, who's delivering all of the actions because um, we, the Department of Education, can deliver say on the extended offer. That will definitely be, you know, something that we'll be taking forward. There'll be other aspects of it that have to be led by other departments, and there are aspects that are funded. So, for example, the Women's Centres Child Care Fund is funded currently by DFC. Um, so there may be elements of it where. If there's a revised scheme, for example, for Bright Start, you know, we might say, well, what's everybody currently funding that could come into a, a, a collective scheme or something like that? But there will be areas where key departments lead and take the lead on, on certain aspects 
of yeah. the delivery because it, it is an executive uh, strategy. So at the moment, there isn't really a budget. We just have a central budget of around 1.2 1. million or something. That's what we currently have for childcare. But there, there are childcare services being delivered by other departments in terms of economy with funds for <coughs> childcare elements of training courses. DFC funds certain aspects of childcare, and uh, as does health. So, yes, we need to look at collectively um, how do we deliver this and wh where are the resources going to um, be allocated to to take it forward. And Cathy, can I thank you for the extent of engagement that you have and, and yeah. your colleagues have led in relation to childcare through the Programme for Government Working Group, through uh, the All Party Assembly Working Group on Childcare, in, in the absence of an Assembly yeah. way to in, engage on these issues. Um, and I think, as you alluded to earlier, ongoing engagement with providers in the sector will be invaluable mm -hmm. to. To getting the, the best childcare uh, framework in, in place, can I, Pat? Can I just uh, use the opportunity to, to ask about the early years framework for children with special educational needs? And and I, and I suppose to return to some of the matters that were raised earlier, I, I genuinely don't want to make you a, a lightning rod for our interrogation of EASN provision. Um, but you, you will be aware of the extent of this committee of parents of organisations across our community's concern with regards to EASN provision. We had a, I presented a, a 6,000 person petition opposing the proposed reduction in SEN nursery <coughs> hours from full time to two and a half hours. We, we saw protests against the handling of proposed Belfast Special School area planning. And of particular concern Document. has been cases in relation to SEN transport, pupils being left on buses, um, pupils being left to incorrect addresses, and of course concern with regards to the handling of documentation for SEN school applications, which, as you've alluded to, is the subject of an internal EA uh, audit, even though a lot of people called for a more independent approach to that audit. So, you, you will appreciate that this committee and the public will be shocked and concerned to learn of changes to the EA SEN management arrangements. And I, I would ask, does that mean that personnel have been relieved of their duties in EA SEN management? Yes. Okay, and can For you... that part of their duties. They will continue with other duties, but in relation to statutory operation stroke special education... Yes. And, and can you give the committee any advice as to the reasons for that, given the level of concern that will be in place in relation to that? I wouldn't be in a position to, to uh, advise the committee in that regard, but um, the corporate leadership team is taking that piece of work forward. Um, what I've been advised of is that temporary management um, arrangements have been put in place. And that is the limit of what I can tell you. Okay, at the and minute, you, you can assure that those alternative arrangements are adequate to respond to the wide range of challenges in SEN at this moment in time. Yeah. Okay. I I, I, I can feed back okay. the questions that you have raised at the okay. minute, and um, in, in terms of those arrangements that have that that have been put in place in relation to that specific area of work, okay. that someone is taking that responsibility okay. at the minute. It is not within my remit. I, I, I appreciate sure. that you'll take. Yeah, I'll sure, bring sure, in. Sure. Yeah. It would not be appropriate that Pat returns ASAP to update the committee on... Yeah, uh, and, and or the relevant personnel. Yes. But we I appreciate, Pat, that you will take those yes. concerns back. I think the committee will write to the Education Authority to um, request a, an urgent briefing. I know that the Education Authority are scheduled to present in relation to special schools in two weeks' time, Clark. We yep. may require a more urgent briefing than that. And I'm, I'm glad to bring other members back in for supplementary in relation to this. Um, Catherine Kelly. Uh, Pat, this might be one for you. It's more of a comment than anything. Um, in the last fortnight, I've been contacted by a number of community playgroups in OMA okay. um, who have come under serious pressure due to a small number of PEG allocations. Um, and they want to know why they, there is a you know a pref one to six preference whenever every time their allocation 
um, is filled automatically and they have uh, children um, <coughs> outside of that. Um, and it's just to make that comment, I think that um, I myself worked in an e-school and know um, the pressure that there is that comes on staff um, and parents mm -hmm. whenever you know the pay allocation comes through yeah. and mm -hmm. you're worrying about um, if you're going to have to let staff go and it's just it's something that needs to be considered as well um, going forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, thank you for that, and I, I can feed that back. Um, PEG adheres to the preschool admissions process, which is for statutory as well, and um, th that <coughs> the process that uh, is engaged. I think that some of the issues you see at this time is the result of a decrease um, in the population. Mm -hmm. um, so what you will inevitably find is that there will not be as much need for places in particular areas. And the PEG has to work with that because what we can't do is fund um, settings that are unsustainable or that don't have an uh, appropriate amount of children in those settings, um, at least eight children, um, to deliver the curriculum. So PEG has got to work with that. We are conscious of the difficulties that are being faced by settings and um, we are listening to their concerns. Okay. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, um uh, thank you, Chair. Pat, just to go back to some of the comments that the Chair has raised. One of the biggest concerns that I'm picking up uh, across my constituency and beyond is the state of CYPS and also the mishandling of those documents in relation to SEN children. And really the rumbling on of it, but I'm just, I'm just wondering, in terms of the internal audit, so if a decision has been reached for changes to be made at a very significant leadership level. Has that audit now ceased? What I can advise is that I, I am aware that an audit was carried out. I know that at a recent committee meeting with the leadership team of EA that they undertook to share the content of that audit, if I'm right, with the committee, or that they were um, approaching the end stage of signing off on that audit. So again, I would need to raise it with, with the corporate leadership team, I have not been involved <coughs> in the audit, per se. When did it cease? Um, the audit itself, the first stage of the audit itself, would have been completed just in the last number of months, as far as I'm aware. But there may be additional work that is required. And when was the decision taken for these changes at a significant leadership level? I was informed of these changes about four weeks ago, approximately. Chair, when were they at the committee? Less than four weeks ago. Okay. So this is a serious issue then, Pat, mm -hmm. and I trust that those in EA will be listening to this, and I sincerely hope that they heed this. The concern of many parties, of all parties in fact, around SEN and the mishandling of it by the Education Authority is of serious concern to me as a local MLA from my own constituency, but also as a spokesperson for education for the entirety of Northern Ireland. This is something that should have been shared with this committee, certainly prior to today, and it's unfortunate, Pat, that you've been put into the position where these questions have been posed to you, that is not what we had wanted, but in the interest of transparency and in the interest of our public and our children, particularly those who fall under SEN, uh, we need some transparency around these things. It's very, very, very disappointing to hear that we have had a presentation in recent weeks and this wasn't mentioned. I heard this whispered very quietly to me in recent days. I haven't heard it anywhere else, and now it's been confirmed today that these changes have been made. The other question is, who has been put in place? Because I think that's an important question. Uh, <coughs> if there's someone in place, surely you know who's been put in yeah. place, and I think that's important to be shared as well. Um, one of the assistant directors within CYPS has agreed to take on the additional responsibilities associated with special education. Um, it is Una Turbot. Okay. And, and given what we've learned today, Pat, and again to stress the Chair's remarks, I think it's vitally important that in the immediate aftermath of today's meeting, that the information is shared as to what action has been taken, an explanation as to that action, what findings from the audit that led to that action, and ultimately what the plan is moving forward. Is there going to be a reform of how these matters have been handled, uh, and what the outcome of the investigation is, and also why senior people with a very significant public profile, have been removed from positions of authority. 
I, I confirm that I will undertake to do that immediately following okay. this committee. Committee, I, I I'll make a proposal in relation to this as well once our, our session concludes here. Um, Pat, I do want to give you an opportunity to speak to the early years framework on uh, for children with special educational needs. I, I was very grateful um, that uh, you led uh, an EA briefing to the all-party assembly group on learning disability when we uh, endeavoured to act as a, a consultative body to respond to that uh, consultation in the absence of the functional assembly. Um, some of the key issues that uh, came up uh, during our consideration of that issue was obviously the the, the amount of hours for SEND nursery provision. Um, the draft document had proposed three hours um, per day, um, and also <coughs> mention had been made of early years SEND centres and I think SEND officers in terms of mm -hmm. um, peripatetic engagement as well. Can you? The, the consultation has closed, and we have asked EA to brief us on. Uh, an analysis of the consultation response, but can you give us some idea as to the direction of travel around some of those key proposals that were made by the consultation? Following the close of the consultation, the feedback was analysed and a draft report developed, um, and I undertook to uh, finalise finalise that piece of work. Um, notwithstanding the significant interest in this review. At the outset, the uh, number of responses was lower than we would have anticipated. Um, we did have uh, 225 online responses in terms of the survey and then 44 significant responses from organisations. Those have been analysed. Um, they would be for the Minister's consideration alongside the proposed framework. So I wouldn't be in a position to share the detail of that, but, but what I would be happy to tell you is for um, a large number of the proposals, there was a high level of agreement. Um, the area where there was a difference of opinion rather than disagreement was around the duration. Um, so therefore, that has been identified in the draft report. But again, in terms of how we move forward, that it would be subject to ministerial consideration um, before I could comment on the outworkings of that. Um, just on that, again, um, I'm working very closely, EA is working very closely with our colleagues in DE to expedite that piece of work and I would hope that we would be going to the Minister um, within the next number of months following the proper governance processes within EA. Um, again, in terms of the proposed framework, um, presenting to the Minister a final framework for consideration that also will include considerations around costings. So work has been taken forward currently on finalising an outline business case in, in relation to that. And there's a number of key elements um, that would require financial investment. And that would be the early years SEN inclusion service. And that would be the early years practitioners, which will, will enable the downward extension of that support to not just settings children, but also parents. Um, from as young as possible, and also the early years SEN centres, um, again, working with health to minimise the costs uh, in relation to those two factors. Okay. And again, that would be taken forward um, <coughs> pending ministerial approval. If it was something that we did want to do, um, we would be very keen to do it um, in relation to um, working with key stakeholders through a co-design and co-participation process. Okay. All of which were positive proposals um, that in terms of the responses you've received. Um, thanks very much indeed. The, the, the committee would be keen and eager to make sure that we receive uh, a briefing on the analysis of the consultation before any final decisions would be made, obviously. Um, so thank you for that. Um, okay, members, uh, officials, thank you very much indeed for your, your presentations today. Um, improved provision of early years, early education, child care for all children and young people, but particularly those with special educational needs is a priority for the committee and obviously for the executive. So we'll continue to engage with you on these issues and we appreciate your uh, briefing today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Members, I give the clerk an opportunity to summarise actions following from that briefing.
So, Chairperson, if I've listened correctly to what members have said, um, in no particular order, uh, writing to the Department, and we're, I think, seeking sight of um, officials refer to some preschool research uh, on effective preschool provision. Just I, I wasn't aware of that. So, the Department is, appears to have amended its position on the value of full time versus part time, and this is based on research. So, might the committee want to see the new research? Yeah, agreed. Okay. Uh, additionally, then they referred to an Insight Innovation Lab, so perhaps we could find out more about that and the department's consultation plans in respect of its early years and childcare uh, offer. Yeah, that's okay. Clark, very, very briefly, just in, in terms of the research around the, the optimal duration of provision, there, there was significant distress caused in the last mm -hmm. um, session by the EA proposed reduction of SEN nursery hours to part-time and the special schools leadership group that we met with previously um, under previous leadership gave really strong evidence against that reduction. So it is welcome that research has changed interpretation from the department point of view and, and I hope that that will feed into the duration of hours being proposed for Saying nursery hours in their framework as well, so grateful for that action and <coughs> in, in follow up. Thank you. Additionally, Chair, then um, I think officials referred to an engine revalu evaluation of Bright Start, so members might want to see that. There was the mention of case studies as well. They also referred to the timing of legislation being in place for the next intake, so perhaps you'd write the department just seeking what their, their views on when we can expect some legislation yep. um, on this matter because that would uh, affect our own forward work programme. Also, members, I provided a table of the Learning to Learn policy at page 21 of your packs. If you're content, I'll send that along to the department. Just ask them to fill in, like what I've said, not done, or maybe not complete. Um, maybe they could just give us just a couple of lines, not looking for war and peace, on the sort of individual bits of the, of the policy. Aye. Uh, because as the member had asked a particular question about CPD, for example. Um, additionally, they referred to a childcare and early years um, sort of joined upness project, um, which involves, for example, Department for Communities and, uh, you know, talking about their contribution via neighbourhood renewal, so perhaps we could find out the terms of reference, etc., of said group. And additionally, as the Chair just mentioned, uh, we could seek sight of the consultation feedback from the consultation on the uh, SEN uh, special school uh, preschool uh, provision. Uh, you can see in your packs at, oh, there we go, at um, page 168, actually page 178, it sets out the six things um, that they were going to do. So it might be interesting to see what the consultation feedback is. Um, we are seeing um, the Education Authority in two weeks' time to talk about special schools. So um, perhaps also a chairperson that could write to the Education Authority asking them to comment on that and also on the SEN inclusion service, yeah. uh, which is one of, the, one of the six things they're providing. Additionally then, writing to the Education Authority, separate issue, around um, the reorganisation of responsibilities um, in the Education Authority, set out what the management changes are, um, what the reasoning is, the timings, etc. And uh, again, repeating our request for sight of the findings of the audit. We've already written to the Minister about this, as, as members were very concerned about it previously, and we're seeking urgent update. And if I'm sensing correctly, the, the committee is content to rearrange its timetable to hear about this as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah. or, or I'm, I, I guess I'm noticing there that... Um, the EA is scheduled to brief us on special schools in two weeks' time. Yeah. Um, uh, our members be content that we ask for an oral briefing of the written information that we've requested as part of that schedule. Yeah, yeah content. Okay, Chairperson. Okay, and additionally, um, in, in previous mandates, uh, the committee has received uh, information, oral briefings from organisations like the Early Years Organisation and Employers for Childcare. Um, do you want to schedule those in? It would, it would be after Easter now because we were quite full up. But uh, just to give you background, um, because there was scant reference, for, for good reason, uh, to things like uh, the Pathway Fund, and we are going to hear about Sure Start another day. So this would uh, help members uh, sort of supplement their knowledge uh, on, on some of these, which I know is quite extensive in a number of cases around the table. But uh, are you content yeah, no, to have more? I, I, yeah, members, I, I think it would be essential that we hear from... Uh, sectoral uh, bodies and organisations in, in response to where we're at on, on childcare provision and we can 
de designate a day to do that. And if members have ideas for particular organisations, they won't be invited. I know we've been doing informal <coughs> meetings, but I think it's important that we hear from mm -hmm. organisations mm -hmm. like Girl Years, Organisation Employers for Childcare, and in public session in relation yeah. to such an important issue. Agreed? Right. Okay. 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 Sure. Sure. I think so. Just to go back to that, right? Yep. We've left the room. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks ago, they sat there and talked to us about an internal review when a decision was reached four weeks ago. Is that any way to treat this committee? The, the, it, it's clear the Education Authority had all directors bar a director for Children and Young People Services at that briefing and had a fulsome opportunity and to, to notify this committee of, of these changes. They decided not to take it. Um, I mean, the, You've raised issues previously, and in, in my experience, that the Education Authority communication on matters is as problematic as its administration of matters. I, I, they, there was an opportunity there to, you know, deliver a clear update in relation to that matter, as well, in order to avoid raising any further concerns about the processes being followed here, in addition to the substance of what the processes are auditing. There is an opportunity in two weeks' time here, and I, I, I hope and I trust that they will return on avail of that opportunity to provide a more fulsome update with regards to the audit and an explanation for those those changes to personnel. Because as I said, the, and, I, and I don't say this to make uh, you know public show the the issues around special education yeah. and these provision are are wide and have been wide for some serious time. We. They, they cannot afford to be anything other than fully open and transparent in relation to this matter. I will make that request for that information and hopefully take that briefing um, you know, in person from the directors as well. But um, I encourage members to continue to take you know, a, an active scrutiny role in relation to these matters. But g given some of the huge and very public issues around this area in terms of SEM, and the mishandling of it by the Education Authority that is well documented and has been publicly spoken of by many principals and teachers and parents. For them to sit at this committee and discuss those challenges with remarks made and comments made by the probing questions of this committee and not mention that there has been a, a move <coughs> to remove people in positions of authority and senior leadership is a disgraceful situation and also it's clear that there seems to be a conscious objective within the Education Authority to withhold this information until some of the guy who has been told about this in recent days asks a question of them. Yeah. I don't think that is appropriate given their ridiculous record uh, on this uh, and also the many people and children, teachers and principals that have been let down by the mismanagement of this entire thing. I agree. I will only add to public concern around these matters. Um, a full team was available at the committee to deliver updates on this in, a, in an open, in a controlled way from the relevant personnel. I have some sympathy, to be honest, that Pat Ward was yes. put in the position where um, Pat was the EA official who was required to report on such a serious matter. Um, when directors were in place to do so a matter of weeks ago. Can I suggest, Chair, I mean, I have to be honest, um, colleagues and I discussed it afterward. I think on a number of fronts, the, the recent um, presentation this committee had from the EA uh, was inadequate. Mm -hmm. uh, and questions not answered, figures that you would have thought they would have had not uh, actually given to this committee and so on. Surely it would be appropriate for you as chair of this committee to write to the chief executive, mm -hmm. the education authority, asking the question that why when there was such a, as you have said, a high power delegation uh, here, making a presentation to this committee, everyone around this table uh, would have been dealing with these issues over the last number of years. They are hugely sensitive, they're hugely difficult, <coughs> for the young people concerned, for the parents concerned, for the principals and the staff concerned at the schools, uh, why we were not uh, taken into uh, consideration and that information given to the committee. Because um, apart from anything else, uh, there's an issue about communication, there's mm. an issue about yeah. trust, there's also an issue about common courtesy. Yes. Yeah. 
a yes, and I think we we will invite the chief executive to return um, in two weeks' time uh, when they're scheduled to brief us in relation to special schools to to give us the briefing that they should have given us formally um, a matter of weeks ago. Yeah, Karen, Mull, deputy chair, chair and clerk of my memory serves me right at that last meeting. The chief executive and ours were to come back. Mm. We had that pencil done, and they told us that they weren't coming. So that was on the back of the, 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 the mm -hmm. audit, but they couldn't give us any detail. We'd ask them to come back. So we did have a dip pencil done very quickly after that, yeah. which we probably would have been informed, and now we haven't been. So um, my fear in this is, and I know you've written to the minister, we ask for an audit and they don't agree, or, well, we'll have to take that forward, but there was a dip, and I just think that... Um, it is unfair that our officials are going to be coming in here and be questioned by us on it. So the chief executive does need to come in and give us a yeah. full update. But I, think, I think we need to be um, conscious of the fact, um, yes, unfortunately, Pat has been subjected to those questions today, important questions, albeit. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. But, yeah. but the, the fact that when they were here two or three weeks ago, that information has been known within the Education Authority for four weeks. Mm. So they sat in front of this committee, knowing full well of the serious changes that were made around the questions that were being asked and failed to mention that there has been a significant change in leadership. That is not acceptable. And I think that that message needs to go very, very strongly to the new chief executive. And I would certainly hope that she's not going to continue the legacy of the previous chief executive, because this education authority needs to be tightened up. Communication needs to be addressed around matters such as these, particularly when this assembly is functioning and maybe it's the case that the education authority is so used to rumbling on without accountability particularly in the absence of these institutions for three years but this stops now if they're here again and any serious changes are made like that they need to be sharing it in an open way as mr humphrey has said it's common courtesy at least i agree and clark will submit that request in writing for that all information that we have referenced and for it to be orally presented in two weeks when the Education Authority are scheduled to be with the Committee on Special Schools Matters. Content members, yeah. Great. Okay. I'll move to agenda item six then, members. <coughs> this is our briefing from the Department of Education and the Education Authority on nurture issues. Uh, can I refer members to the clerk's cover note on the nurture briefing at page 217? Uh, the Department of Education brief briefing paper on nurture provision at 227, an Education Authority paper on nurture and tabled items, an Education and Training Inspectorate nurture review of 2015 at page 234, uh, a briefing paper from an evidence session dated the 14th of December 2016, and the Queen's University of Belfast nurture full evaluation report at page 254. And then can I welcome officials to the committee? Mr. Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education. Mrs. Judy Humphreys, Head of Additional Educational Needs Team in the Department of Education. Ms. Una Turbert, Assistant Director of Pupil Inclusion, Wellbeing and Protection at the Education Authority. And Mr. Sean Irvine, Regional Manager for Nurturing Approaches in Schools at the Education Authority. You're, you're very welcome to the committee uh, today. Our predecessor committee for education considered nurture on a number of occasions. Members looked at the QUB review and also considered the issues in respect of the provision of nurture support to IME schools. At the time, there seemed to be a limited number of schools um, resourced for nurture techniques, and almost all of them were primary schools. I think they numbered perhaps 50 or more, maybe uh, 30 uh, receiving funding from the Department of Education. There was also reference to nurture in the 2017 to 22 program government. However, um, hopefully you can give us a, a clearer picture uh, on the current state with regards to nurture provision. It seems that around 1,500 teachers have undertaken the EA training and an ETI review of 79 schools found that a third of those uh, were availing of nurture provision. Uh, for all these reasons that the committee is obviously very interested in how nurture is being taken forward in our schools. So can I invite you to give a, a short presentation to the committee and then I'll open for questions. Thank you. 
Chair, thanks very much. Um, you've done the introductions for me. <laughs> um, we're very glad to be here uh, this afternoon to talk to you about um, Nurture. Um, I'll say a few words uh, about what's currently happening within um, the programme, and then we'd be very happy to take some questions. So, um, Nurture groups bring together groups of around six to ten children, typically from years one to three. Um, who are coming to primary school with the social, emotional and behavioural difficulties and which prevent them from learning effectively and if unresolved we prevent them from achieving their full potential. The groups provide intensive support for pupils with attachment difficulties, immersing them in a safe and caring environment, building their trust and confidence and giving them a sense of belonging <coughs> to their school. They maintain close links with the mainstream classes and they seek to equip the children with skills and coping sc strategies to allow them to participate fully and learn effectively in those classes. Parental involvement is integral to nurture, helping parents better understand their child's needs, using them to reinforce the learning and development taking place <coughs> and allowing them to see how it can also benefit their home life. Reasons why a child might need nurture are many and varied, but in every case, if not addressed, those problems become barriers to learning um, leading to underachievement and disengagement from school. Preventing that waste of opportunity in, in young lives is a key aim of nurturing. Nurture groups follow a range of established nurture principles first developed in the 1970s by educational psychologists Marjorie Boxall and Marion Benathan. It was only with the emergence of research on the effectiveness of nurture groups in the late 1990s, early 2000s, that the approach really began to attract wide, wider interest. Nurture groups here in Northern Ireland were established uh, around the year 2000 and it was through the then Department of Social Development which started to provide funding for nurture groups as part of the Neighbourhood Renewal Programme. And that aimed to tackle disadvantaged in new and innovative ways. And I think the first schools at that time were Tully Carnot and Bally Sally Primary Schools. In 2013, 20 new nurture groups were set up under one of the executives delivering social change signature projects. Uh, and this was jointly de delivered by DE and DSD at the time. And DE also extended the programme to fund 10 previously established nurture groups. When the D DSC funding ended in June 15, the department secured funding to sustain those 30 nurture groups while an evaluation of the provision was carried out and a future position was decided. Two Irish medium schools joined the pilot in September 16 at which time the department was providing funding to 32 schools. However, with the closure of Tully Cornet in August 17, this was reduced to 31. In 2016, we commissioned Queen's to undertake an evaluation of the impacts and cost effectiveness of the 30 nurture groups. Their report was published in September 16, and I think you have seen that. The findings demonstrate very clearly that nurture groups are highly successful. <coughs> achieving the improvements in social, emotional and behavioural skills of children who were previously struggling to cope with school. The report highlighted the particularly strong progress made within the nurture groups by looked after children and children involved with social services and those with free school meal entitlement. A separate evaluation by the Education and Training Inspectorate found that nurture groups had a significant positive impact on the children's social, emotional and behavioural development, provided the children with strong coping strategies help build resilience and help the children to learn more effectively. The inspector also found that with the right support, the nurture groups quickly became highly effective. So Chair and members of the committee, all the evidence suggests that nurture can help turn the curve in this area uh, and make a difference in individual lives. Um, the current position within the department is that we continue to fund those 31 nurture groups and the minister in his previous tenure as education minister gave a commitment that the department would continue to fund these groups until a decision on a new nurture programme was made. So we're currently working on, de on developing proposals for a future nurture programme which will be presented to the Minister in the near future. In the interim we're working with the Education Authority in testing the whole school nurture approach across all our schools. This involves awareness and support for school staff on nurturing approaches and allows schools which don't have a nurture group to offer to vulnerable pupils um, experience social and emotional difficulties arising from attachment issues. Um, I have a take any questions. <coughs> have. Thank you, uh, William Humphrey. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, okay, thank you very much for your presentation, um, and I hope hopefully clarification because I think confusion seemed to reign uh, after our meeting last week. 
uh, in relation to the 31 schools that you've mentioned in the 2.5 million budget. Uh, we got the clear impression, I think uh, Mr Bradley and I both asked questions, that this budget of 2.5 million was going to be for all schools that would be included in the nurture system. And I should declare an interest, Chairman, uh, I'm a governor at Edinburgh Primary School in North Belfast which benefits from nurture unit and it really does benefit because I've spoken to the principal, to the staff and the teachers who work in it uh, and some of the parents whose children have been through it. So it is hugely, hugely important to the children's experience at school and, and their education. But can I just simply ask you to clarify the position in terms of this 2.5 million? Uh, is the 2.5 million to work with the current 31 schools and what will the position going forward with the addition, uh, what I understand, I think was two, an additional 2.5 million pounds, is that right? So, yes, I'm happy to clarify that and just <coughs> agree with your point about how useful um, mm. the nurture groups are. Um, I think the committee has actually written to the department on this issue mm. as well, yeah, so yeah. We, we will, of course, be responding to that. At the minute, the current nurture groups are funded and it's 2.25 million. Um, the minister has given his commitment to continue with that funding until the decision is made on the broader programme. So the 2.4 million, which has been identified for the next three financial years, is in relation to expanding the programme, be it building on the existing number of nurture groups. And that, of course, will be subject to the department securing that additional funding. Okay. So the 2.5 million is to continue current provision and then there's an additional 2.5 billion to expand provision is that right no no so to expand there's a marker bid down pressure bid of 2.4 million to continue with the existing program would cost 2.25 million so that is seen as an existing funding requirement the pressure bid is in relation to the additional nurture groups that would be funded so um, in terms of the I welcome the clarification around the 2.25 million. Um, there's obviously been a quarter of a million lost somewhere along the line since last week, but in terms of the money going forward, the 2.4, <coughs> how many more schools then will be brought into the nurture net to, to allow those young people to benefit? I think ultimately that will be a decision for the Minister based on the criteria that's set around expanding the programme. There is a broad figure of how much it costs to run a nurture group. Um, in and around 70,000. But he won't obviously regularly pull the schools out of the air. You will be presenting him with a paper of schools that you will have assessed. Absolutely. And it's it's not just about the funding of the nurture groups. It's also about the funding of the whole school nurture approach, which is really about trying to embed nurturing principles right across the wider school network. So an element of that money we would advise should be for that aspect of the work. So it wouldn't be about every single school having a nurture group. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, thanks, William. So, <coughs> the 2.25 million is baselined. That that funding exists to continue provision. It's an existing funding requirement, Chair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, the existing the, funding. Uh, well, of course, we don't know what the budgets are for next year. Okay. Um, but, uh, like I say, the minister has given that commitment to maintain the existing okay. groups. The 2.4 million is requested. It's bid for funding. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And um, as uh, Mr. Humphrey had asked, that would be allocated in terms of a criteria. Can you give us a bit of more idea of how a school is awarded funding for nurture provision? I can tell you how the existing groups were selected, if that helps. Um, yeah, it doesn't need to be great detail. Just, oh, no, just you know. <coughs> so the criteria applied. Um, under the Deliverance Social Change Signature Project related to primary schools which were which had levels of above average free school meal entitlement, below average attendance rates, and below average results for key stage one and two, and above average numbers of pupils with statements of special educational need. So they were the objective criteria that were set. Uh, between DE and DSD it would have been at the time. Um, then there were an additional 10 nurture groups that were brought on board and those were existing nurture groups that were being funded primarily by DSD through Neighbourhood Renewal uh, and there was a further set of criteria that was used there in relation to extended schools criteria 
uh, and the schools were ranked according to free school mean entitlement. So they're the broad criteria at this stage. Free school meal, is that numbers or percentage of pupils at the school? Or is it percentage term or real terms? Percentage terms? Yeah. Okay. Okay, percentage. Okay. I've come across instances where you can have uh, an apparent low percentage of free school meal pupils, but high number if the school is a large size. Um, so that, that just interesting from that point of view. Do, are you, have you managed to establish how many schools have unfunded nurture provision? Yes, we are aware of around a further 19 nurture groups which are in place but not funded through the funding. Okay. Uh, bring in Daniel McCrossan. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome back, Ricky, and to your colleagues as well. Um, whoever prepared the briefing paper for this is very good. <laughs> There's a lot of detail in it. Thank you. So these, these folks around me. <laughs> thank you for, for that level of detail. It's a, a very interesting topic. And just you've covered some of this, but so there's 19 schools registered. Is that is that many? No. So we have 31 groups. 31 groups. Month. Right. We are aware of a further 19 that are operate the nurture group yes, system, that's right, but they're right, not funded okay. by us. Uh huh. Okay, I was just going to head around that. So, so, so in terms of uh, in Table 1, it says uh, it looks at school. Why are those schools being added in the 1920 period at Level 1? Uh, let's see now. Is this on page 5? Uh, you, you, you want to answer that one? Okay. The, the 1819 was when the whole school nutrient approaches model of support kicked in. So that information went out to the 813 primary schools across Northern Ireland of which the 256 engaged with the Level 1 at that point in, in the September. What, what was the figure, sorry, to? Uh, 256. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's right, yeah. Out, out of the 813 primary schools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Ricky, can you give some... We, we touched on this the last time you were here, and you, you mentioned the holistic whole school approach. Could you maybe expand a wee bit on that, I think? Uh, Mr. Newton was very interested in it, uh, and I'd be interested in hearing a wee bit of an expansion on that as to exactly what it is um, in terms of establishing nurturing approaches to support all the children. So what, what do you mean by that term, holistic whole school approach? Thank you for that, um, and I'm conscious that I didn't probably answer that question very well the last time from Mr. Newton. Um, <laughs> Uh, I can strike that one off. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember correctly, the question was, what do you do for a child that walks into school and has had breakfast that day? Uh, and I think I said that we hope that that school applies a whole school, whole child approach. What does that mean? Well, I'll let Sean come in in a second in terms of describing the whole school nurturing approach, um, which is really what I should have said at that time, um, but I'm now properly informed. Um, it is about the school being able to recognise and identify those children who are vulnerable from the moment that they walk in and being able to put in place something to deal with that. And that could be as simple as providing breakfast. And I know from some of the visits that I've had in recent weeks to schools where this happens, that whole school approach does apply and works very well. In terms of the proper theory behind it, this is where I ask um, Sean to talk a wee bit more about the whole school nurturing approach, because I think that nurturing approach is, if we can embed that within our primary schools without the need for nurture groups, we, we're likely to achieve um, fantastic results. Sean? Yeah, um, so the, the whole school nurturing approaches model of support is primarily based on this dissemination of good practice from our current 31 nurture groups. Um, obviously, nurture will be well embedded within the 31, uh, and definitely we need a whole school <coughs> approach for that nurture group to run effectively and as effectively as it possibly can. So the premise of the, the model of support is to take that best practice, to take the theory, embedded within nurture and the six principles of nurture and to disseminate um, in the first element an awareness raising, understanding of what nurture is, um, and then certainly build on the capacity and knowledge of, of what nurture can do 
in our, in our primary school sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think it's fair to say that all children need nurtured. Every child needs to be nurtured and our schools need to be nurturing safe places um, for all children. And it's not just the teachers who are teaching children who need to nurture them. It's the dinner lady, it's mm -hmm. the lollipop, <laughs> the, not the lollipop man, the, 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 the patrol man. It's, it's everybody who notices. If you have um, one these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but it is. Person, it's, by the way. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the whole school community getting behind and having a, d developing an ethos within the school yeah. which is caring, compassionate and notices children. <coughs> um, any child who needs, who needs help as opposed to taking... Um, a different approach, which might be about asking them to take time out or, or other methodologies that have been used. Yeah. That's what nurture, it's, it's, it's about creating safe, secure space for all children that they can benefit at that level. And then for those who, additional, who have additional needs and additional responses, that's where we need to then put in additional nurturing interventions. So it very much links to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago around emotional health and wellbeing. And I see the whole school nurture approach as a key mechanism in terms of informing our framework around emotional health and well-being. <coughs> so there, there's a difference between uh, a nurturing approach and a nurture unit. Yes. yes. It might explain why ETI review of mental health and emotional well-being in 2018 found that of the 79 primary schools polled, a third appeared to have developed nurturing provision. They may not necessarily have had a nurture unit then, yeah, mm -hmm. which is why your numbers are closer to 31 yeah. funded and 19 unfunded nurture units. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, and I mean, that, that's pertinent in terms of constant um, reference to the need to build resilience yes. In, yes. in children and young people, that this um, may be a way to uh, progress that. But I imagine we do need some more long term funding and longitudinal study of the practice to bottom out exactly what that looks like, yeah. I think that's right, Chair, and I think Queen's identified that as part of their evaluation. I mean, overall, their evaluation was very positive. We have a really strong evidence base here and we need to move on that, but they did say that we need to be cautious in terms of the findings because we would need further research to see what the longer term outcomes would be and to compare that with those children that haven't been in nurture groups. So that, of course, requires us to look at that over a number of years. Okay. Daniel, I think you'd asked the original question. Yeah, yeah, just, you want to come back in? Uh, yeah. He answered the, the next question that I had in relation to it. Uh, thank you for the, that explanation. I <coughs> no doubt that Mr Newton will like, want you to expand on it further. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a, in terms of the so, so 31 existing units, um, there's a proposal for 29 new nurture units. Is the criteria going to be different? Um, uh, in relation to those? So there, there isn't a proposal for a set number at this stage. Right. Um, but is there a, a rough guide or a rough well, understanding? Well, what we've done is there's a pressure bid for 2.4 million. Yeah, that's uh, right. And in very broad terms, and I, I don't wish to determine how much that would be, but that could allow for funding of up to an additional 30 and also yeah. allow for maintaining the existing whole school nurture approach which is a separate amount of money which is needed to support those schools. So it will be for the Minister to decide in terms of the criteria and the balance <coughs> between funding additional groups and promoting the whole school nurture approach. And my advice would be that that balance needs to be right because we can achieve a lot with the whole school nurturing approach and training schools in the principles of nurturing without necessarily having to have the groups in place. Well, in your opinion, do you feel that the criteria will, do you, do you get a sense the criteria will change or should change? Or? We really don't know at this stage. Um, it would need to be based on robust and objective um, need. Yeah. Uh, I feel that the criteria that was used in 2013 for the signature projects <coughs> was at that time correct in relation to free school meal entitlement, in relation to attendance levels and attainment levels. I mean, that is the obvious starting point for us. But again, I think you know, it will be for the Minister to decide if that criteria needs to be widened or if it's not suitable anymore. And just briefly, how, how will the Department support the schools that are operating on their own initiative in that regard? So as, as Sean said, um, he and his team have been supporting schools who have approached the EA, looking for advice on whole school nurturing. So it will be our intention to try and maintain that. And in fact, 
I think try to expand on that if we could. Sorry, no problem. No, okay. I, th I think it's fair to say that there's a real appetite mm -hmm. from schools. Yeah, there is, um, yeah. There's a demand um, that we are seeing in relation to, to nurturing approaches and to nurture groups. Um, and, and, and there's good reason for it, I think, as you have alluded to, that, that there's real benefit for children and for the, for the school community. Mm -hmm. um, so we are very keen to support as far as we possibly can within our existing mm -hmm. resources yeah, to promote nurture as an early intervention, a prevention and early intervention strategy. I think, and that's what I, I was just going to say that, um, in a, this is about early intervention and prevention. Yeah. This is why the focus is on primary schools. Um, and if you look at Marjorie Boxall and Marion Benethon and why they've gone down this road, they talk about trying to get, be get behind the problem, trying to understand the roots of the difficulties in terms of social, behavioural and emotional problems that children have. So Nurture Groups is about trying to intervene on those issues at the right time. And that investment at that stage uh, in the child's life could potentially have a huge ceiling for the public purse further down the line. And just briefly, Rick, is my last point. I completely understand and appreciate the importance of this scheme, and, um, and I've spoken to quite a few in relation to it. How many, you've probably touched on this figure, so how many have applied, how many schools have applied to benefit from this? So if we separate the groups yeah. from the approaches, right, um, so we are continuing to fund the 31, so that's still in yeah. place. Um, we haven't had an application process, so that's just still 31. 19 schools have picked it up themselves and are self-funding. That could be through extended schools money or whatever money. The what would the cost of that be uh, for the school? It's around 70000 per annum. Right, OK. Yeah. In terms of whole school nurture approaches, maybe Sean, you could talk about the numbers? Yeah, so as I said, uh, to this date we have 308 schools that have been engaged in the model of support um, through the, the, the three, three stages, the progressive uh, <coughs> elements. Um, at level three, we call it, is the whole school inset, so that's when the delivery of the capacity building really commences with every member of staff within the school community, uh, and to that point we going from January last year, 2019, we've had 88 schools yeah. uh, make application for that, and that is increasing because obviously we are on the second phase of that process currently. Okay, so 88 schools. Something I just, I forgot to add in terms of a cost. I just I need to put that in. Um, if you've been to a nurture group, you'll know it's a physical place within the school. It's a safe place. It's a place where there's a living area, a learning area, a, a dining area. There's a cost to the school to make that happen. So if we have new nurture groups, there's an initial outlay of around 10,000 capital. So if we had 30, that's 300 grand. That marker is down as well uh, as part of our pressure bid, uh, that 300,000 capital expenditure. Okay. Thank who, you. Okay, Dan. Who, who delivers the capacity building for whole school nurturing approach? Delivered by the EA. Uh, there are a number of teachers that have been employed here off the substitute teacher register. Uh, and I think Sean manages that process. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, from September uh, 2018 to, to current, current day, uh, the additionality funding allowed us to uh, employ um, further members to capitalise on the model of support. It is a three-stage process, but when we get to the level three, not only is it capacity building for the whole school, but there will be follow-up capacity building sessions on the interventions that our nature groups would utilise. And in addition to that, to really establish the, uh, the methodology and indeed the interventions within our schools, our staff are modelling those interventions with key targeted classes within, within the school community. So if you imagine nurturing approaches is a universal capacity building program, nurture groups would be more targeted and moving into the more intensive work, whereas the whole school element really capitalises on that universal and moving into a more targeted element. Okay, so there is a, a reasonable body of work developing here in relation to this then, yeah? There's a good evidence base that's being built on, yeah. Okay, William, did you want to come in yeah, on something that was raised yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I meant to make the biggest point of the, um, my earlier contribution. You make and you rightly really identify that going back to sort of the initial pilot, mm. uh, that it was monies that was provided by the then Department for Social Development. 
the successor department does obviously, obviously department for communities. Mm -hmm. Are they being of any assistance in terms of money? Uh, Can they, or have uh, they been approached? Well, they may be funding some through their neighbourhood renewal program. Actually, yeah. uh, some of the ones which we're not funding. Um, so I know because I'm just happening. wondering if if there's money that, that is coming through Department of Communities, mm -hmm. does that mean? I mean, why would every school not want one of these units, having been in, uh, involved in one, and mm -hmm. say the school in which I'm a governor, but also visited others like Curry? Yeah. You know, they are of such. Uh, import and um, make such a difference to the to the young person's life. And when Robin talked before the the school day, the school experience, um, and I just think you know we need to maximise the number of schools that actually can participate. So, you know, if there are schools that are being supported potentially through that route through um, communities, I think then that might mean that there are more that can can be involved because it it's just so hugely important. And look, the other thing I pointed would make, sir, Chair, is um, I thought it was back at school there, um, <laughs> is uh, thanks for all the work that continues to be done because it is making a difference and it's really, really important. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Robbie Butler. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you, guys. A really important piece of work, and I seem to say it every time people come in. However, um, I, last week I found myself tweeting out whole school, whole child, but what I would like to add to it this week probably is whole school, whole child, every child. And, and on that, it, it will become of no shock to you guys that one of our um, priorities is, is, is in peeling back on the SEN provision uh, within all schools and particularly within the topic of discussion today. So I've just about three questions here and I'll fire them out and hopefully I'll not ask any more or the chair will tell me off on the other side. So if I can just give you the questions and perhaps you can pick them up. Okay. So um, what are the impacts and outcomes for children with SEN, um, which is the, the, the starter? Um, are there any funding implications with regard to perhaps improvements, positive impacts on children with SEM um, through Nurture? It's also my understanding that, uh, that on statementing, any identified resourcing is financed by EA, not by the school, and if that is the case, um, is there any implications with this uh, programme? Uh, and I'll um, <coughs> Thank you. I suppose what I would say initially is I know we're due to come back to the committee in two weeks' time on SEN uh, and the new SEN framework, and that might be the better time to get into the detail of some of those um, questions, unless you know, you're able to. Oh, I think that's, that's a fair suggestion. If you're happy with that. Well, I think yeah, one fair. of yeah, I think one of the the uh, because, and that's why I'm thinking it's, it's the whole school, whole child, every child. Yes, that's including why, those with SEN. Yes, that's including those with SEN. So, yep. uh, and and the children with SEN will have particular. Um, difficulties perhaps within this, and I'm sure it's been, it has been picked up in some of the measured outcomes. It has, and I think I think in terms of the special needs that we're talking about for these, you know, for some children, it is about their social and emotional and mm. um, behavioural difficulties, which was actually their barrier to to learning. And what we're what we're hope, you know, we're, we're achieving and working towards with these children is increased self awareness and their and their self efficacy and their own self belief mm. and who they are, their emotional literacy. Um, their motivation to be involved in 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 school in school life and in, in learning, and particularly in relation to their relationship building and their able to, their 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 ability to be empathetic and to to themselves and others, um, so there's certainly those are those are key outcomes that we're that we are working towards whenever we are delivering on nurturing approaches. Um, <coughs> you know, through the box hall um, evaluations and whilst it's early days that we are seeing some improvements in relation to those box hall scores mm. for children who have learning, uh, who have learning needs. Yeah. And, and I think that's my point, is that there, there, you, the, you talked about the cost implication of providing the service, I think £10,000 per school. There's obviously resourcing issues and finance issues when I tell a statement in terms of so some of the offset stuff, for instance, under the Queen's study, mm -hmm. um, is recommending areas which actually speak very easily into SEN provision. So my question would be, is it, is it EA, for instance, if, if a, a, a child being statemented, EA, and there's a resource implication, is it res, uh, EA that have to deliver that then in terms of the budget and the resourcing? And if that's the case then in, this, in the nurture provision, then is it, a, is, it, is it potentially an offset saving? So I suppose and it, it depends uh, where the child is on the SEN register, okay. what stage. Uh, so the current framework has five stages. Um, in terms of stage one, and stage two, that's primarily school-based support. So the stages will be determined by the school uh, and their best place to assess uh, where the register of the child is. 
Um, if they're state, if they're on stage three, then that moves into the realm of the EA provide the support, um, and that can be through the services that the EA currently provides through, and that's through an educational psychologist assessing the child and then determining the best services required. And then, of course, stage four is the statutory assessment stage, and stage five is where the child has a statement, and the statement will specify exactly what is needed. Yes. Possibly in which particular school, yep. uh, but it will go into detail in terms of the educational needs and how they need to be met. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm probably pretty bad at asking the question. So at, at stage five, and the resource <coughs> plan has been identified. Mm -hmm. The EA, it's my understanding, the EA, if it's been identified, as the EA, then are charged with the responsibility of providing that. So in the in the nurture setting, then where some of it might be offset by this investment, is is, is the value that I'm trying to. Mm. The balance here, you know, yes. it seems like good value. So yeah. I'm just thinking it's a, it's a really good case to maybe pick out in the... In and the, in and the I think the difference there, um, Mr Butler, is that the nurture intervention is supposed to be short term. It's supposed to be two to four terms. Okay. If a child has a statement, that statement will be reviewed every year but could stay with them for the duration of their school life. Yeah. So you do get that added value in terms of in the nurture group because the statement might say that the child has social, emotional and behavioural difficulties which the nurture group is able to satisfy and build on. But once that nurture group has finished for that child and the child's reintegrated, reintegrated into mainstream school, <coughs> the statement and those needs <coughs> are still there potentially and will still need to be met, met through whatever is required and that's where the EA are there. Is that accurate? No, I think that's fair, that's fair to say. I think the important thing is that if, I suppose it is the whole purpose of early intervention. So if a child has social and emotional difficulties, that is actually their barrier to learning. And we can intervene in that early school years. What we would like to see is that they no longer need that level, that they build resilience and they're able to cope. Yeah. And therefore, further down the line, they actually don't need statemented for additional provision in relation to social and emotional um, yes. difficulties. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that in two weeks' time we'll have we'll much yeah, more to, yeah, yes. to chew over this. And that, but I do appreciate. It. I just do. I just had the fear that we would miss it today. We'll go back to it, and then we'll say, "Well, no, that was nurture. You should have asked that when we were talking oh, right, about nurture." Right, right. So I think there is a, there is a correlation in there, and I do accept that, that it is perhaps much more. We we have we have a figure um, from our thirty-one funded nurture groups, which would suggest that fifty-four percent of pupils that come through our nurture groups would move down the code of practice. And as, as Ricky suggested, it's between stage two and three of the current code of practice that a, that a child would be attending a nurture group. So 54% of them would move down the code of practice in that sense. I suppose that builds on the evidence base then to say that yeah. nurture works. Yeah. I presume uh, the selection of pupils for participation in the nurture unit is for the school? Yes. Yeah. The school but based on a... similar criteria to the criteria used to fund <coughs> the nurture unit? It's based on the Boxall profiling, okay. which was developed by Marjorie Boxall. So there is a, a questionnaire, uh, and then the school would regularly assess the okay. children who are in the nurture okay. groups two or three times a year and yeah. see how they're progressing across various competencies. That, that is a pertinent question from Robbie, though, in terms of if you can provide us with a bit more evidence of the impact of nurture unit provision on social and emotional away. skills of pupils with special educational needs. That would be helpful. Um, thanks, Robbie. Taryn Mullen, Deputy Chair. Thank you for your presentation, and uh, glad to finally meet you, Sean. I've um, been on the phone day over the last number of years, and you've provided great information and advice for myself in relation to schools um, who have accessed the, the training. Um, and to the schools, primary schools in my area that have uh, nurture unit that I have had the pleasure of visiting on a number of occasions, the St Paul's and Holy Family. So just as Ricky has said, you know, going on seeing how it works, um, uh, seeing the function of both of those schools, and it's just something that Ben had said around operate the whole school community. But when we talk about the whole school community, they, it is the community. So both of them work very, very closely with the community organisations and the family support groups, so it goes wider. So I suppose any models going forward, um, I, I would ask that, um, you know, is it going to be taken into consideration to be more inclusive in terms of that, having uh, others coming in and, and working within the nurture unit and providing services like, and I know in some of the schools it does happen, but maybe more in a structured way because we know the vital or the, the real 
the role that youth workers can provide um, and how young people really relate to them. A lot of this is down to the people involved in leadership. <coughs> so we see we see the good work and all that. So it's, it was really around that. And then the last day that yourselves was in around the mental health and wellbeing framework, I had the opportunity the following day to attend a post-primary school in my area, Oak Grove, which has a nurture unit. So we, we heard that day, Ricky, around the pressures in terms of counselling, the waiting lists and support. Mm -hmm. So again, visiting the school, meeting with the, the staff there and the young people. And I think it was said that day that, you know, um, the pressures, counselling's not for all young people. Mm -hmm. And very much I heard that loud and clearly that day. So in terms of the nurture, it's immediate access. Um, uh, they're not on a waiting list then for a couple of months. Um, it's immediate. Um, a lot of this stuff can, you know, staff can support young people or they can act, you know, signpost to others or whatever immediately rather than a counselling. So young people are very clear as well that there needs to be a range of support, a range at, at, uh, uh, at the earliest stage. So again, I'm hoping that that's going to uh, frame the work going forward. A lot of my question has been answered around the criteria that Daniel had asked, but it's really going to be about how you manage that demand that, that's going to come forward. And again, I suppose if we, had a, if we had the budget, I believe all schools, primary and post-primary, should have this, but we don't. So um, in terms of oh, the minute, there's two different sets of criteria, and Ricky did go on it, and there will be options presented to the Minister. But it's going to be how we manage that demand and have at this stage, did you, is there a, an expression of interest has went out to schools or are you just working off that, you know? I think if we if we separate the nurture groups from the whole school nurturing approach, mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been an application process for nurture groups. Yeah. But of course, you know, there have been approaches and representations by mm -hmm. yourselves and others who have said the school in the area would like to be like to have a nurture group so we're aware of those <coughs> in terms of the whole school nurture approach there was an expression of interest that was opened up to all schools for them to approach the ea and for the ea to work with them so that has actually reached out to i think 250 schools uh, and has been quite successful so it's easier to uh, to fund the whole school nurturing approach yeah. and support the principals within the school than it is to actually get the funding and set up a new nurture group. Yeah. So a nurture group wouldn't be the right answer for every single yeah. school. Yeah. But uh, uh, it, it's going to be difficult to manage the demand because, yeah. as you yeah. say, you've obviously been yeah. approached by even us, and that's only a, a small number um, that yeah. I have highlighted. So no. thank you. Okay, Catherine Kelly. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I've visited schools in my area as well that are doing amazing work. Um, and I think that we also have to commend the work of well, not just the schools that are funded, but the schools that are unfunded. <coughs> and they're taking this on um, without any, any resource. Um, and at a time when there are a lot of pressures in schools. Um, but ultimately, the, the, the need is there and the focus is on on the ch on the child, um, it's not really a question as such. It's, it is just a comment. Um, I know that we would love to see it in every school. I think the need is there, especially when we talk about um, the mental health and well-being of our children and young people, um, and early intervention, um, and in relation to as well adverse childhood experiences. And you mentioned Dana about building resilience, and that's it. And the earlier that we do, um, the more chance that our children are able to, you know, there are no barriers within school, they're able to excel at whatever they, they do. Um, and for a lot of our children, school is the only constant in their lives. Um, and that's un unfortunate, but it's how it is. And the likes of the Nurture Programme is something that, that does need to be embedded. Um, and if we had a, a magic money tree, I would love to see it in every school so that every child had that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree, and we, we really want to roll this out as much as we can. Uh, so when the budget is set, uh, and I know what, what we have, then we'll work with EA and others in terms of how best to spread uh, the approach. Thank you. Okay. Robin Newton. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for returning and 
Thank you for answering my question via Mr. McCross and his <laughs> ability to build on, on, on it, uh, Chair. I'm not going to ask a question, Chair. I, I'm, I'm really going to just make uh, three comments based on the evidence that we have uh, in front of us. And I do think we are on the cusp of something. Uh, I'll describe it as quite exciting in how we uh, address uh, the early preparation uh, for children in school. And indeed, the Queen's University uh, and their economic evaluation of the project, and just their short comment, which says that nurture groups will present direct savings to the education system through earlier intervention. And that in itself should be telling uh, this assembly that we are and our need to invest in, in the education in these early years. The, obviously, the, the ethos <coughs> that you referred to in the holistic approach to the child is, is based on school leadership and Queen's University's um, comments around the importance of leadership uh, being a pivotal role, and um, particularly for the, the, the principal. And I do have to say, I think the, 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 where they're talking about the recruitment of nurture group uh, teachers and the importance of looking, and their comments, the importance of looking beyond qualifications and identifying a range of key personal characteristics, including firmness, fairness, compassion, empathy, energy, and so on. And indeed that you then build on the qualifications uh, through, and I was using the expression to your, the delegation previously, continuing professional development. Of the, and I think the, the, those are, each of those in itself uh, would indicate to us, Chair, that there is something actually here that is we're moving beyond the experiment, moving beyond the research and searching for the money to ensure that the implication strategy is, is put in place. Just if I could come in on that, just to say I completely agree and to pick up the point about leadership. Um, I recently met Ashley Galway from Corrie Primary and she really demonstrated to me the importance of the leadership point. Uh, she relayed the story of one individual child that had been through the primary school that had a traumatic background and left the school. Uh, by the end of the, t uh, the period in the school, you know, the, the child was pupil of the year, complete turnaround in terms of behaviour and emotion. And that was because of the nurturing principles and the leadership uh, through Ashley herself and the rest of the school. So it's, it is about the child, but there are other benefits here in terms of bringing parents on board mm -hmm. and working with the parent-school relationship, mm -hmm. um, also with the wider community, which you mentioned, yeah. uh, and also within the school, j between pupils and teachers and within teachers. So, you know, the benefits are there for everyone to see. So I really think we, we need to push in this as much as we can. Okay. Thanks very much, members. Thank you, uh, officials, for your, your presentation today. And it's certainly an issue that we'll continue to engage with you on. And indeed, we are scheduled to visit Curry Primary School and Edinburgh Primary School to uh, experience it uh, firsthand. So thanks, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. <coughs> okay, members, I'll ask the clerk to summarise the actions and request for additional information resulting from the briefing. And the Thanks. officials have cleared. Thanks, Chairperson. If I've uh, understood correctly, I think is the committee wishing to write to the Department for Communities, subject to the agreement of the Committee for Communities, just asking about uh, funding streams for nurture. I think when I was Clerk of Social Development, I think that stopped, but that, let's find out and yeah. uh, see what the yeah. truth of it is. Yeah, you're talking about it might be coming through the. Neighbourhood uh, Renewal. Mm -hmm. Renewal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which obviously they fund. Yes, indeed, yes, Chairperson. And also to write the department uh, in line with what the Chair indicated, just seeking if they have information <coughs> on the impact of nurture on SEN and uh, you know, where that places uh, children on the, on the SEN register, as the member also indicated. Didn't have anything else? Members, we're happy. Nope. And obviously we do have those visits uh, scheduled, Clark, in the near future. Yeah. Yep. Well, when are they? 
with, it's been half term, so the schools haven't answered us, uh, but uh, we will be sorting it out soon. And uh, as you know, we, we have previously visited both schools, and they're quite easy to do. Um, so we should be going to have fast paced. Indeed. Mm. William, that's your uh, rota schedule for the year. Okay. <laughs> Ticked. Mm. <laughs> <We're just sinning>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, members. Uh, agenda item seven then is correspondence. Uh, can I ask the, the clerk to speak to the correspondence we've received? Thanks, Chairperson. We have four items. Uh, there's a summary note which is included as uh, item 7.1 on page 390. Uh, if we can ask, Chairperson, members are content to follow the suggested approach. Um, with the exception of the following. So um, on page 396, there is restricted correspondence from concerned parents about the use of, alleged use of restrictive practices, restraint and seclusion in schools. Uh, the concerned parents indicate their understanding is that DE only requires schools to record instances of restrictive practices. Uh, the parents make serious allegations about physical assaults in a special school. Uh, members may wish to note that uh, for their information that ETI has previously <coughs> reported issues around on the other side of the coin, special school staff suffering assaults or injuries from um, from their pupils. So, um, Chair, I actually think that that matter has been circulated to MLA. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I. Um, okay then. So. Uh, I've marked it as restricted. Not, not by us, obviously, though. Yeah. 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 No, 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 directly yeah, 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 by yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so to, to explain, members, yeah, um, that the uh, marked it as restricted because um, it may it, it includes sort of personal information which may be of um, concern to an individual. Yeah, and I'm content members. with that approach taken yes, from a committee point of yes. view. Obviously, individual MLAs can decide how they respond to having received correspondence directly. I, th I think the actions that will flow from this will be the same, regardless of the uh, of how the correspondence is designated. In that, uh, Clark, I think you agree, and I'm happy to propose that we seek an oral briefing from the department with regards to restraint and seclusion practices, mm -hmm. um, and write to the education authority uh, seeking their response as to how the serious allegations have been addressed. Members content with that approach? Um, in, in addition to the department, I'm aware that the British Association of Social Workers has done extensive work in relation to making recommendations around new legislative guidelines for uh, restraint and seclusion practices. And it might be that on the same day we're receiving the briefing from the department that we hear from BASW with regards to okay. um, the way forward. It's my understanding that the Children's Commissioner and the uh, Ombudsman for Northern Ireland intend to review yeah. restraint and seclusion as yeah. well. I'm not sure if um, when we're receiving the briefing that will have been initiated um, at that stage, but if it, if it were to have been um, initiated, we can maybe invite the Children's Commissioner and the Ombudsman as well to brief us in relation to that. I, I hope and I, I expect that this is an issue that the Minister and the Department can make fairly prompt progress on once reviews have been undertaken. Scotland and England and Wales are acting to improve legislative guidance on restraint and seclusion as well, so we, we need to get our act together <coughs> and, and progress that. Members content if we advise the, uh, the uh, senders of the correspondence um, as to the actions that we're taking in order to progress this? Yes. You content with that, Clark? Yeah. Probably. Agreed. Okay. Uh, so at uh, page 401 is a letter from. Uh, yes. Um, no. Well, if, if you like. Um, but, uh, yes, Chairperson, uh, yeah. 7.2 yep. is at page 392. This is from the Public Accounts Committee. Um, they're uh, intending to hold an inquiry into the NIO report on major capital projects, including Struhl. So uh, for members, I don't need to tell the chair that. Public Accounts Committee this, but PAC has primacy over matters uh, from when they are added to the PAC's forward work programme until the memorandum of response received from the department. And in fact, I think PAC of late has also um, been following up on memorandums of response so the primacy can extend a bit further. So that might make it a little bit tricky for this committee to review uh, procurement issues around Struhl but I don't think it has an impact in respect of, say, visiting Stroll and seeing what happens next. Um, additionally, 
My informal understanding is that PAC are uh, to undertake an inquiry into special educational needs, which they might get to before the summer. I'm looking, at Mr. Humphrey. <laughs> uh, hopefully, but um, there's an awful lot to get through, especially with the first. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. there's, there's another one after that. So that's it's clock that, So that the that's a consideration of a report by the Northern Ireland Audit Office, yes, isn't yes. it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that it's. Not on their forward book program yet, and we'll be the AC committee. Indeed, um, so sure the chair can change that. <laughs> <laughs> this is why they don't send those notes. Usually, <laughs> so the list is very agreeable and sent this note to me. And that's usually why they don't. Let's make notes. sure he gets in for questions <laughs> first for the next few weeks. <laughs> okay. So just then, yeah, really for members to note. So at uh, page 401 is a letter from an EA employee about transferred redundancies. The committee doesn't deal with individual cases, but um, I, if the committee's content, we can write on to the department about the issues raised. It's just to give members an understanding of the redundancy uh, picture in schools. We've already asked for some facts and figures about where the department's going, but there are certain um, arrangements and practices um, around transferred redundancies that are... Um, are they unique? Yeah, they might be. Um, so it might be interesting just to explore that uh, with the department if members are content, Chairperson. Okay, agreed. Agreed, yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. 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 That correspondence, Clark? It yeah. certainly is. Okay, agenda item eight then. Can, can I just make yeah, go ahead. Um, the, the third inquiry that we've selected is on special educational needs, uh, which the committee um, might just want to be about. Be of interest, and I want to try and get to that for the summer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is, is that, is that uh, on the basis of the NIAO report, the inquiry? Yeah, okay, so it, it, it follows it up, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. another report, as the, the member, the person of PAC is aware, so they did a report about two years ago, um, which talked all about SEN and statements and such like, and then they were returning again to another report, which is to be published in March, and I imagine the two. Um, will be of interest to uh, PAC, but I... Um, that, that's how PAC inquiries work. They, they kind of take forward the, rec the work of the they, reports. They, yeah. they gave us uh, what, thir um, 11 various reports that they had done, okay. which members came to... It's a fair backlog, yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. okay, thanks, William. Uh, agenda item 8, then, members, is our for work programme. Draft for work programme is available at page 403. Um, Okay, the next few weeks' briefings um, are uh, particularly fulsome. Um, they are important and well organised um, in terms of thematics, and obviously we need to take a, the urgent addition from the Education Authority. Are members content with that forward work programme? Yes. So, chair, yeah, Chairperson, yeah, Clark. What, what I'm sort of getting at here is it too much um, because uh, we're just about finishing up one now? Um, and if it is too much, members should just speak up and uh, either now or later. And uh, these these things go. It's the committee's forward work program. Happy to amend. Committee uh, department might not be too happy, but I'm more concerned that members get the value out of these scrutiny sessions and they're not uh, slaughtered mm -hmm. by them, so to speak. Chairperson. Yeah. So, okay. So next week um, there are three oral briefings. There are. Yeah. Week after that, there's going to be two. Plus, uh, joint one the week after that. Two, two. I, there, I think members. I, I'm, I think if we appreciate that, given the backlog of issues, that committee meetings are perhaps slightly longer than they otherwise would be. But we are getting through some important mm -hmm. issues. So, um, if, if members maybe want to reflect on the forward work program, if they think it can be reconfigured in any way, and share that with me and or the clerk. Um, and obviously as well, we're. Um, exploring visits, okay, um, a number have been recommended, um, and if they want the committee to visit elsewhere, um, can members <coughs> provide the clerk with details of locations, contact uh, people, um, and we also may wish to have the committee's visits coincide with um, significant issues at that location or, or policies connected to the visit as well.
Super. Okay, Chair Clark. Yep. If we're going, sorry, if we're going to Strule, we're going to Strule. When we go to Strule, um, maybe we'll try and visit Orville A, as I said previously, yeah. uh, if that doesn't work at school. But members also wanted to go to Sure Start. It's, <laughs> it's beside it as well. It's on Great. The same well, road. so if they will yeah, yeah. contact us with details, which is the person we can talk to, so that we don't uh, disrupt the business of the, the Sure Start Centre or wherever that we're going. So Mr. Humphrey wanted we can also show members how bad the A5 is on the way down. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been left in no doubt <laughs> listening to you yesterday. Uh, <laughs> uh, think William. Yeah. The Minister for Infrastructure is dodging him. Listen to him yesterday, you, you wouldn't go anywhere near him. <laughs> the, 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 no um, choice. No, no. The, just a couple of points. In terms of the, we, the joint meeting with health, mm -hmm. uh, yes. are we any closer? And also, we did discuss a, a stakeholders meeting at an event as well. Um, just on those two issues. And thirdly, um, in terms of the IFA GA sports programme, does that not also include the Ulster branch of the RFU? Can do. Uh, I think that would be because I think the three. Well, my, going back to my decal days, chair, the three of them would have come in together. I'm um, not sure if they, if they still do. But, I'm not, I'm not but, sure of that. That's yeah, what I'm but, asking. But, I mean, if we're inviting the the IFA and GA to present on the sports programme, mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm open to making it a, a three yeah. code presentation as well because there will be other is educational issues relating to all three codes that, yeah. that might be pertinent to hear from them on. Uh, yes, Chairperson, in terms of the middle, the uh, Joint Committee meeting with Health, um, they uh, <coughs> wrote back and suggested that whenever the Mental Health Action Plan um, is produced, so remember there's a uh, cross-executive group talking about yeah. this, so something's supposed to come out within 100 days or so, so mm. around about that period, and then there will be a revised mental health action strategy, so it's in around there um, that uh, I think that the joint meeting will happen, and that's what the uh, Committee for Health suggested. And in terms of our event, I th I'm feeling now that this is going to be an evening event because mm. I think it's going to be a bit bigger. Yep. Uh, what I've done is I've written to the department asking them for their list of consultees because I'm going to pillage that. I come back to the committee and say, look, here's a list of people I think we should invite. Members will supplement that, I hope. And uh, then we can arrange something, um, an evening event to talk about um, or the mental health and emotional well-being uh, framework because um, well, given that it's not going to be ready for 10 months, this could actually be a very useful mm -hmm. intervention from the committee. could even be a committee motion if you felt like it, and um, uh, could uh, usefully inform the department's um, consideration of this important issue. But okay. Members content? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, agenda item 10, as I mentioned earlier, the Department of Education briefing on the emergency bill has been deferred. Um, therefore, the date, time, place of our next meeting is Wednesday, the 4th of March, 9.45 a.m. here in room 30. Committee meeting does now adjourn. Three. Do you chair? Three. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.